Part 3 Chapter 21 Dreams Come True While Julian and I worked slavishly to reach the top of the ballet world, Chris whizzed his way through college, and in his fourth year he entered an accelerated program for medical students, completing his fourth year of college while simultaneously beginning his first year of medical school. He flew to New York and explained it to me while we strolled hand in hand in Central Park. It was spring and the birds were chirping and merrily collecting the trash they needed to build nests. Chris, Julian doesn't know you're here, and I'd rather he didn't find out. He's terribly jealous of you, and Paul, too. Would you feel insulted if I didn't ask you over for dinner? Yes, he said stubbornly. I came up to visit my sister, and visit my sister I will. Not furtively, either. You can tell him I came to visit Yolanda. Besides, I only intend to stay for the weekend. Julian was obsessively possessive of me. He was like an only child who needed constant pampering. And I didn't mind, except when he tried to keep me from my family. Okay. He's rehearsing now, and he thinks I'm home doing housework before I join him this afternoon. But stay away from Yolanda, Chris. She's nothing but trouble. Whatever she does with any man is news for the class the next day. He gave me a strange look. Kathy, I don't give a damn about Yolanda. She was just my excuse to see you. I know your husband hates me. I wouldn't call it hate. Not exactly. All right, call it jealousy. But whatever it is, he's not keeping me from you. His tone and his look grew serious. Kathy, always you and Julian seem just on the verge of making it big and then something happens and you never become the stars you should be. What is it? I shrugged. I didn't know what it was. I thought Julian and I were as dedicated to the dance as any others, and even more so. And still Chris was right. We'd put on a spectacular performance and draw rave reviews, and then we'd slide backwards. Perhaps Madame Zolta didn't want us to become superstars, lest we leave her company and join another. How is Paul? I asked as we sat on a bench dappled with sunlight and shade. Chris had my hand in his, and tightly he held it. Paul's Paul. He never changes. Carrie adores him. He adores her. He treats me like a younger brother he's very proud of. And really, Kathy, I don't think I would have made it as well without all the tutoring he gave me. He hasn't found anyone else to love? I asked in a tight voice. I didn't fully believe Paul's letters that said there weren't any women he cared for. Kathy, said Chris, putting his fingers tenderly under my chin to tilt my face upward to his. How can Paul find anyone to equal you? I could have cried from the expression in his eyes. Would the past never set me free? No sooner did Julian see Chris than the two of them were at it. I don't want you sleeping under my roof, stormed Julian. I don't like you, and I never have and never will. So get the hell out and forget you've got a sister. Chris left to stay at a hotel, and on the sly we met once or twice before he went back to his school. Dully I went back to attend class with Julian, then the afternoon rehearsal and the evening performance. Sometimes we had the lead roles, sometimes only minor ones. And sometimes, as punishment for some sarcastic remark Julian would make to Madame Zolta, we both had to dance in the corps. Chris didn't visit New York again for three years. When Carrie was fifteen, she came to spend her first summer with us in New York. Hesitating and frightened looking from the long flight she'd made all alone, she ambled slowly through the bustling, noisy crowds at the airport terminal. Julian spotted her first, and he cried out, then bounded forward to sweep her up in his arms. Hi there, gorgeous sister-in-law, he greeted, planting a hearty kiss on her cheek. My, how much you grow to look like Kathy. First thing you know, I won't even know the difference, so watch out. Are you positively sure the dancing life isn't for you? She was made happy and secure by his pleasure to see her again, and quickly she responded by throwing her arms about his neck. 
In the three years Julian and I had been married, she'd learned to love him for what he appeared to be. Don't you dare call me Tinkerbell, she said, laughing. It was our standing joke, for Julian thought Carrie just the right size to play a fairy and kept telling her it still wasn't too late for her to become a dancer. If someone else had even suggested such a thing, she would have been deeply insulted. But for Julian, someone she deeply admired, she would be a fairy only by flitting around and fluttering her arms. She knew he meant fairy as a compliment and not a criticism of her small size. Then it was my turn to have Carrie in my arms. I loved her so much I was overwhelmed by the force that swept over me and made me feel I was holding a child born of my own flesh. Though there was never a time I could look at Carrie and not long for Corey, who should be at her side, I wondered, too, if he had lived, would he, too, stand only four feet six inches tall? Carrie and I laughed and cried, exchanged news, and then she whispered so Julian wouldn't overhear, I don't wear a training bra any more. I've got on a real one. I know, I whispered back. The first thing I noticed was your bosom. Really? She appeared delighted. You can see them? I didn't think they showed that much. Well, of course they show, said Julian, who shouldn't have sneaked so close to eavesdrop on this sisterly confidence. That's the first thing my eyes go for once they get past a fabulous face. Carrie, do you realize you have a fabulous face? I just might kick out my wife and marry you. It was a remark that didn't sit well with me. Many an argument we'd had because he cared too much for very young girls. However, I was determined to let nothing spoil Carrie's vacation in New York the first time she'd come alone, and Julian and I had mapped out a schedule so we could show her everything. At least there was one member of my family Julian would accept. The months flew swiftly by, and then the spring we'd waited for so long was upon us. Julian and I were in Barcelona, enjoying our first real vacation since we'd married. Five years and three months of married life, and still there were times when Julian seemed a stranger. Madame Zolta had suggested the vacation, thinking it a good idea if we visited Spain so we could study the flamenco style of dancing. In a hired car we drove from one town to another, loving the beautiful countryside. We liked the late evening meals, the sleepy siesta afternoons lying on the rocky shores of the Côte d'Azur, but most of all we loved Spanish music and dancing. Madame Z had mapped our tour throughout Spain, listing all the villas that charged nominal rates. She was thrifty and taught all her dancers her tricks. If one occupied one of the small cottages near a hotel and cooked their own meals, the fee was even less. So this was where Julian and I were on the day Chris's graduation invitation arrived. It had followed us all over Spain to catch up with us here. My heart jumped when I spied the thick, creamy envelope, knowing it contained the graduation announcement of Chris's achievement, his medical degree at long last. It was almost as if I myself had completed college, then medical school, all within seven years. Very carefully, I used a letter opener so I could put this souvenir in my scrapbook of dreams, some of which were coming true. Inside was not only the formal announcement, but also a note on which Chris had written modestly, I am embarrassed to tell you this, but I am the top grad in a class of 200. Don't you dare find an excuse to keep away. You have to be there to bask in the glow of my excitement, as I bask in the radiance of your admiration. I cannot possibly accept my M.D. if you aren't there to see, and you can tell Julian this when he tries to prevent your coming. The bothersome thing about this was Julian and I had signed a contract some time ago to tape a TV production of Giselle. It was set for June, but now in May they wanted us both. We were sure that television exposure would make us the stars we'd strived so long to be. It seemed a perfect time to approach Julian with the news. We had returned to our cottage after touring old castles. As soon as our evening meal was over, we sat out on the terrace, sipping glasses of a red wine he was nuts about, but that gave me a headache. Only then did I dare to timidly approach going back to the States in time for Chris's May graduation. Really, we do have the time to fly there and be back in plenty of time to go into rehearsals for Giselle. 
Oh, come off it, Kathy, he said impatiently. It's a difficult role for you, and you'll be tired, and you'll need to rest up. I objected. Two weeks was plenty of time, and a TV taping didn't take too long. Please, darling, let's go. I'd be sick not to see my brother become a doctor, just as you'd be if your brother was reaching the goal he'd strived for year after year. Hell no, he flared, narrowing his dark eyes and shooting sparks my way. I get so damned sick and tired of hearing Chris this and Chris that, and if it isn't his name you drum in my ears, then it's Paul this and that. You are not going. I pleaded with him to be reasonable. He's my only brother. His graduation day is as important to me as it is to him. You can't understand how much this means, not only to him but to me as well. You think he and I live lives of luxury compared to yours, but you can rest assured it was no picnic. Your past is something you don't talk about to me, he snapped. It's exactly as if you were born the day you found your precious Dr. Paul. Kathy, you are my wife now, and your place is with me. Your Paul has Carrie, and they'll be there so your brother won't lack applause when he gets that damned M.D. You can't tell me what I can do and what I can't do. I'm your wife, not your slave. I don't want to talk about this any more, he said, standing and seizing hold of my arm. Come on, let's hit the sack. I'm tired. Without speaking, I allowed him to tug me into the bedroom where I began to undress. But he came over to help, and in this way I was informed it was to be a night of love, or rather sex. I shoved his hands away. Scowling, he put them back on my shoulders and leaned to nibble on my neck. He fondled my breasts before he reached to unhook my bra. I slapped his hands away, screamed, No! but he persisted in taking off my bra. Easy as a mask to take off, he threw away his anger and put on his dreamy-eyed, romantic look. There had been a time when Julian had appeared to me the epitome of everything sophisticated, worldly, elegant, but compared to the way he was now since his father's death, he'd been only a country bumpkin. There were times I actually detested him. This was such a time. I am going, Julian. You may come with me, or you may meet me in New York after I fly back from the graduation ceremony. Or you can stay on here and sulk. Whatever. I am going. I want you to come with me and share in the family celebration, for you never share in anything. You hold me back, so I don't share either. But this time you can't stop me. It's too important. Quietly he listened, and he smiled in a way that sent chills down my spine. Oh, how wicked he could look. Hear this, beloved wife. When you married me, I became your ruler, and by my side you will stay until I kick you out. And I'm not ready to do that yet. You are not leaving me alone in Spain when I don't speak Spanish. Maybe you can learn from records, but I can't. Don't threaten me, Julian, I said coolly, though I backed off and felt a terrible pounding of panic. Without me, you don't have anyone who cares except your mother, and since you don't care for her, who have you got left? Lightly, he reached out to slap both my cheeks. I closed my eyes, resigned to accept anything he did as long as I could go to Chris. I allowed him to undress me and do what he would, even though he clutched my buttocks so hard they hurt. I could, when I chose, withdraw until I was outside of myself looking on, and what he did to me that was appalling didn't really matter, for I wasn't truthfully there, unless the pain was great, as sometimes it was. Don't try and sneak away, he warned, his words muffled because he was kissing everywhere, teasing me as a cat who plays with a mouse when it's not hungry. Swear on your word of honor that you will stay and miss your dearly beloved brother's graduation. Stay with the husband who needs you, who adores you, who can't live without you. He was mocking me, though his need for me was that of a child needing his mother. That was what I had become, his mother in everything but sex. I had to choose his suits his socks and shirts, his costumes, his practice outfits, though he consistently refused to let me handle the household accounts. I will not swear to anything so unfair. Chris has come to see you perform, and you have gloried in showing off to him. 
Now let him have his turn. He's worked hard for it. I pulled free from him then and strolled to pick up a black lace nightgown he liked me to wear. I hated black nightgowns and underwear. They reminded me of whores and call girls, and my own mother, who'd had a fancy for black lingerie. Get up off your knees, Julian. You look ludicrous. You can't do anything to me if I choose to go. A bruise would show. And besides, you've grown so accustomed to my weight and balance, you can't even lift another dancer properly. He came at me angrily. You're mad because we haven't made it to the top, aren't you? You're blaming me because our booking was cancelled. And now Madame Z has given us a leave so I can sober up and come back refreshed, made wholesome by playing games with my wife. Kathy, I don't know how to entertain myself except by dancing. I'm not interested in books or museums like you are, and there are ways of hurting and humiliating you that won't leave any bruises, except on your ego, and you should know that by now. Foolishly, I smiled when I should have known better than to challenge him when he was feeling less than confident. What's the matter, Jewel? Didn't your sex break satisfy your lust for perversion? Why don't you go out and find a schoolgirl, for I'm not going to cooperate? I'd never before thrown in his face that I knew about his debaucheries with very young girls. It had hurt at first when I found out, but now I knew he used those girls like he used paper napkins to casually toss away when soiled, and back he'd come to me to say he loved me, needed me, and I was the only one. Slowly he advanced, using his panther-like stalk that told me he would be ruthless, but I held my head high, knowing I could escape by shutting off my mind, and he couldn't afford to hit me. He paused one foot away. I heard the clock on the nightstand ticking. Kathy, you will do as I say if you know what's good for you. He was cruel that night, evil and spiteful. He forced upon me what should only be given in love. He dared me to bite. And this time I wouldn't have just one black eye, but two, and maybe worse. And I'll tell everybody you are sick. Your period has you so badly cramped you can't dance. And you won't skip out on me or make any phone calls, for I'll bind you to the bed and hide your passport. He grinned and slapped my face lightly. Now, honey child, what you gonna do this time? Smiling and himself again, Julian sauntered naked to the breakfast table, flung himself down, sprawled out his long, beautifully shaped legs, and asked casually, What's for breakfast? He held out his arms so I could come and kiss his lips, which I did. I smiled, brushed the lock of dangling hair from his forehead, poured his coffee, and then said, Good morning, darling. Same old breakfast for you, fried eggs and fried ham. I'm having a cheese omelette. I'm sorry, Kathy, he murmured. Why do you try to bring out the worst in me? I only use those girls to spare you. If they don't mind, then I don't mind. But don't ever force me to do what I did last night. I'm very good at hating, Julian. Just as good as you are at forcing and at harboring revenge. I'm an expert. I slid onto his plate two fried eggs and two slices of ham, no toast and no butter. Both of us ate in silence. He sat across the checkered red and white tablecloth, closely shaven, clean and smelling of soap and shaving lotion. In his own dark and light exotic way, he was the most beautiful man I'd ever seen. Kathy, you haven't said you love me today. I love you, Julian. An hour after breakfast, I was madly searching every room to find my passport while Julian slept on the bed where I dragged him from the kitchen after he fell asleep from all the sedatives I'd dumped in his coffee. He wasn't nearly as good at hiding as I was at finding. Under the bed and under the blue rug, I found my passport. Quickly, I threw clothes into my suitcases. When I was packed, dressed and ready to go, I leaned above him and kissed him goodbye. He was breathing deep and regularly, and smiling slightly. Perhaps the drugs were giving him pleasant dreams. Though I drugged him, I hesitated, wondering if I'd done the right thing. Shrugging off my indecision, I headed toward the garage. 
Yes, I did what I had to do. If he were awake now, he'd be burred to my side all through the day, with my passport in his pocket. I'd left a note telling him where I was going. Paul and Carrie met me at the airport in North Carolina. I hadn't seen Paul in three years. Down the ramp I went, my eyes locked with his. His face tilted up to mine, the sun in his eyes, so he had to squint. I'm glad you could come, he said. Oh, I'm sorry Julian couldn't make it. He's sorry too, I said, looking up into his face. He was the type of man who improved with age. The moustache I'd persuaded him to grow was still there, and when he smiled, dimples showed in both his cheeks. Are you searching to find grey hair, he teased, when I stared too long and perhaps with too much admiration. If you see any, let me know and I'll have my barber touch them up. I'm not ready for grey hair yet. I like your new hairstyle. It makes you even more beautiful. But you're much too thin. What you need is lots of Henny's home cooking. She's here, you know, in a motel small kitchen, whipping up homemade rolls your brother so loves. It's her gift to him for becoming another doctor, son. Did Chris get my telegram? He does know I'm coming. Oh, indeed, yes. He was fretting through every moment, afraid Julian would refuse to let you leave him, and knowing Julian wouldn't come. Honestly, Kathy, if you hadn't shown up, I don't think Chris would accept his degree. To sit beside Paul, with Henny on his far side and Carrie next to me, and watch my Christopher stride down the aisle and up the steps to accept his diploma, and then stand behind the podium and make the valedictory speech put tears in my eyes and a swelling happiness in my heart. He did it so beautifully, I cried. Paul, Henny, and Carrie also had tears to shed. Even my success on stage couldn't compare to the pride I felt now. And Julian, he should be here too, making himself a part of my family and not stubbornly resisting all the time. I thought of our mother, too, who should be here to witness this. I knew she was in London, for I was still following her movements about the world, waiting, always waiting to see her again. What would I do when I did? Would I chicken out and let her get away again? I knew one thing. She'd learned that her eldest son was now a doctor, for I'd be sure she knew, just as I kept her informed about what Julian and I were doing. Of course, I knew by now why my mother kept always on the move. She was afraid, so afraid. Afraid I'd catch up with her. She'd been in Spain when Julian and I arrived. The news had been published in several papers, and not long after that I picked up a Spanish paper to see the lovely face of Mrs. Bartholomew Winslow flying to London as fast as she could. Tearing my thoughts from her, I glanced around at the thousands of relatives crowded into the huge auditorium. When I looked back at the stage, I saw Chris up there, ready to step behind the podium. I don't know how he managed to find me, but somehow he did. Our gazes met and locked, and across all the heads of those who sat between us, we met in silent communication and shared an overwhelming jubilation. We'd done it, both of us, reached our goals, become what we'd set out to be when we were children. It wouldn't have mattered at all about those years and months we'd lost if Corrie hadn't died, if our mother hadn't betrayed us, if Carrie had gained the height that should have been hers and would have been if Mama had found another solution. Maybe I wasn't a prima ballerina yet, but I would be one day, and Chris would be the finest doctor alive. Watching Chris, I believed we shared the same thoughts. I saw him swinging a bat when he was ten to smash a ball over the fence, and then he'd run like mad to touch all bases in the quickest possible time when he could have walked and made his home run. But that wasn't his way to make it look too easy. I saw him racing on his bike yards ahead of me, then slowing down deliberately so I could catch up, and we'd both reach home at the same time. I saw him in the locked room in his bed three feet from mine, smiling encouragingly. I saw him again in the attic shadows, almost hidden in the immense space, looking so lost and bewildered as he turned away from the mother he loved to me. 
vicariously we'd shared so many romances while lying on a dirty old mattress in the attic while the rain pelted down and separated us from all humanity. Was that what did it? Was that why he couldn't see any girl but me? How sad for him. For me. The university planned a huge luncheon celebration, and at our table Carrie babbled away, but Chris and I could only stare at each other, each of us trying to find the right words to say. Dr. Paul has moved into a new office building, Kathy, gushed Carrie breathlessly. I'd hate him being so far away, but I'm going to be his secretary. I am going to have a brand new electric typewriter colored red. Dr. Paul thought a custom-painted typewriter of purple might look a little garish, but I didn't think it would, so I settled for second best. And nobody ever is going to have a better secretary than I'll be. I'll answer his phone, make his appointments, keep his filing system, do his bookkeeping, and every day he and I will eat lunch together. She beamed on Paul a bright smile. It seemed he'd given her the security to regain the exuberant self-confidence that she'd lost. But I was to find out later, sadly, this was Carrie's false facade, one for Paul, Chris, and me to see, and when she was alone it was far different. Then Chris frowned and asked why Julian hadn't come. He wanted to come, Chris, really he did. I lied. But he has obligations that keep him so busy he couldn't spare the time. He asked me to give you his congratulations. We do have very tight schedules. Actually, I can only stay two days. We're going to do a TV production of Giselle next month. Later, we celebrated again in a fine hotel restaurant. This was our chance to give Chris the gifts each of us had for him. It had been our childish habit to always shake a present before it was opened, but the big box Paul gave Chris was too heavy to shake. Books, said Chris, rightly. Six huge, fat medical reference volumes to represent an entire set that must have cost Paul a fortune. I couldn't carry more than six, he explained. The remainder of the set will be waiting for you at home. I stared at him, realizing his home was the only real home we had. Deliberately, Chris saved my gift for last, anticipating this would be the best, and in that way, just as we used to, we could stretch out the enjoyment. It was too large and much too heavy to shake, and besides, I cautioned him, it was fragile. But he laughed, for we used to always try and trick the other. No, it's more books. Nothing else could be as heavy. He gave me a funny, wistful smile that made him seem a boy again. I give you one guess, my Christopher doll, and one hint. Inside that box is the one thing you said you wanted more than anything else, and our father said he would give it to you the day you got your black doctor's back. Why had I used that kind of soft voice to make Paul turn his eyes and narrow them and see the blood that rose to stain my brother's cheeks? Were we never to forget and change? Were we forever going to feel too much? Chris fiddled with the ribbons, careful not to tear the fancy paper. When he stripped off the paper, tears of remembrance welled in his eyes. His hands trembled as he carefully lifted from the cushioned box a French mahogany case with a gleaming brass lock, key, and carrying handle. He gave me a tortured look, even as his lips quivered, seeming incredulous that after all these years I'd remembered. Oh, damn it, Kathy, he said, all choked up with emotion. I never really hoped to own one of these. You shouldn't have spent so much. It must have cost a fortune, and you shouldn't have. But I wanted to. And it's not an original, Chris, only a replica of a John Cuff side pillar microscope. But the man in the shop said it was an exact duplicate of the original and a collector's item nevertheless. And it works, too. He shook his head as he handled the solid brass and ivory accessory instruments and the optical lens, the tweezers, and the leather-bound book titled Antique Microscopes, 1675 to 1840. I said faintly, in case you decide to play around in your spare time, you can do your own research on germs and viruses. 
Some toy you give, he said, gritty-voiced. And now the two tears in the corners of his eyes began to slide down his cheeks. You remember the day Daddy said he would give me this when I became a doctor. How could I forget? That little catalogue was the one thing you took of yours that wasn't clothes when we went to Foxworth Hall. And every time he swatted a fly or killed a spider, Paul, Chris would long to have a John Cuff microscope. And once he said he wanted to be the mouse man of the attic and discover for himself why mice die so young. Do mice die young? asked Paul seriously. How did you know they were young? Did you capture baby ones and mark them in some way? Chris and I met eyes. Yeah, we'd lived in another world back when we were young and imprisoned so that we could look at the mice who came to steal and nibble on our food, especially the one named Mickey. Now I had to go back to New York and face Julian's wrath. But first I had to have a little time alone with my brother. Paul took Henny and Carrie to a movie while Chris and I strolled the campus of his university. And you see that window up there on the second floor, the fifth from the end there? That was my room I shared with Hank. We had a study group of eight guys, and all through college and med school we stuck together and studied together. And when we dated, we dated together. Oh, I sighed. Did you date a lot? Only on the weekends. The study schedule was too heavy for socializing during the week. None of it was easy, Kathy. There's so much to know. Physics, biology, anatomy, chemistry, and I could go on and on. You're not telling me what I want to hear. Who did you date? Was there or is there someone special? He caught my hand and drew me closer to his side. Well, should I begin to list them one by one and by name? If I did, it would take several hours. If there had been someone special, all I would do is name one. And I can't do that. I liked them all, but I didn't like any well enough to love, if that's what you want to know. Yes, that was exactly what I wanted to know. I'm sure you didn't live a celibate life, even though you didn't fall in love. That's none of your business, he said lightly. I think it is. It would give me peace to know you had a girl you loved. I do have a girl I love, he answered. I've known her all my life. When I go to sleep at night, I dream of her, dancing overhead, calling my name, kissing my cheek, screaming when she has nightmares, and I wake up to take the tar from her hair. There are times when I wake up to ache all over as she aches all over, and I dream I kiss the marks the whip made. And I dream of a certain night when she and I went out on the cold slate roof and stared up at the sky, and she said the moon was the eye of God looking down and condemning us for what we were. So there, Kathy, is the girl who haunts me and rules me and fills me with frustrations and darkens all the hours I spend with other girls who just can't live up to the standards she set. And I hope to God you're satisfied. I turned to move as in a dream. And in that dream I put my arms about him and stared up into his face, his beautiful face that haunted me too. Don't love me, Chris. Forget about me. Do as I do. Take whomever knocks first on your door and let her in. He smiled ironically and put me quickly from him. I did exactly what you did, Catherine Dahl. The first who knocked on my door was let in. And now I can't drive her out. But that's my problem, not yours. I don't deserve to be there. I'm not an angel, not a saint. You should know that. Angel, saint, devil, spawn, good or evil, you've got me pinned to the wall and labeled as yours until the day I die. And if you die first, then it won't be long before I follow. Chapter 22 Gathering Shadows Both Chris and Paul, to say nothing of Carrie, persuaded me to go back to Claremont and spend a few days with my family. When I was there, surrounded by all the cosy comforts, the charm of the house and the gardens had their chance to beguile me again. I told myself this was the way it would have been if I'd married Paul, 
no problems, a sweet, easy life. Then, when I let myself wonder how Julian was faring, I thought of all the mean and spiteful ways he had of annoying me by opening my mail from Paul or Chris, as if he were looking for incriminating evidence. No doubt when he flew back from Spain he deliberately let my houseplants die as a way to punish me. But there must be something weird about me, I was thinking, as I stood on the balcony overlooking Paul's magnificent gardens. I wasn't that beautiful, or that unforgettable, or that indispensable to any man. I stayed there and let Chris come up behind me and put his arm about my shoulders. I leaned my head against him and sighed, staring up at the moon. The same old moon that had known our shame before, still there to witness more. I didn't do anything, I swear I didn't, just let his arm stay about me. Maybe I moved a little to contour myself against him when he had me in a tight embrace. Kathy, Kathy, he groaned, pressing his lips down into my hair. Sometimes life just doesn't have any meaning without you. I'd throw away my M.D. and set out for the South Pacific if you'd go with me. And leave Carrie? We could take her with us. I thought he was playing a game of wishing like we had when children. I'd buy a sailboat and take out tourists, and if they cut themselves I'd have all the training to bandage their cuts. He kissed me then with the fervor of a man gone wild from denial. I didn't want to respond, yet I did, making him gasp as he tried to coax me into his room. Stop, I cried. I don't want you except as a brother. Leave me alone. Go find someone else. Dazed and hurt-looking, he backed off. What kind of woman are you anyway, Kathy? You returned my kisses, you responded in every way you could, and now you draw away and pull the virtuous act. Hate me, then. Kathy, I could never hate you. He smiled at me bitterly. There are times when I want to hate you, times when I think you are just the same as our mother, but I don't ever stop loving once I start. He entered his room and slammed the door, leaving me speechless, staring after him. No, I wasn't like Mama, I wasn't. I'd responded only because I was still seeking my lost identity. Julian stole my reflection and made it his. Julian wanted to steal my strength and call it his own. He wanted me to make all the decisions so he couldn't be blamed when a mistake was made. I was still trying to prove my worth so in the end I could disprove the grandmother's condemnation. See, grandmother, I am not bad or evil, or else everyone wouldn't love me so much. I was still that selfish, ravenous, demanding attic mouse who had to have it proven time and time again that I was worthy enough to live in the sunlight. I was thinking about this one day when I was on the back veranda and Carrie was planting pansies she'd grown from seed and beside her were little pots with tiny petunia settings. Chris came out from the house and tossed me the evening newspaper. There's an article in there that might be of some interest to you, he said in an offhand way. I thought about not showing it to you, but then I decided I should. The husband and wife ballet team of Julian Marquette and Catherine Dahl, our own local celebrities, seems to have parted company. For the first time, Julian Marquette will partner a ballerina other than his wife in a major television production of Giselle. It has been rumoured about that Miss Dahl is ill and also rumoured that the ballet team are about to split. There was more to read, including the fact that Yolanda Lang was to replace me. This was our big chance, another of many to make stars of ourselves, and he was putting Yolanda in my part. Damn him! Why didn't he grow up? Every chance we had, he blew it. He couldn't lift Yolanda easily, not with his bad back. Chris threw me a strange look before he asked, What are you going to do about it? I yelled back, Nothing! For a second or two, he didn't say anything. Kathy, he didn't want you to come to my graduation, did he? And that's why he's put Yolanda in your role. I warned you not to let him be your manager. Madame Zolter would have treated you more fairly. I got up to pace the porch. 
Our original contract with Madame Z had expired two years ago, and all we owed her now was twelve performances a year. The rest of the time, Julian and I were freelance and could dance with whatever company we chose. Let Julian have Yolanda. Let him make a fool of himself. I hope to God he dropped her. Let him have all his teeny bopper playmates for sex games. I didn't care. Then I was running in the house and up to my bedroom where I flung myself face down and bawled. Everything was made worse by the fact that I had made a secret trip to the gynecologist the day before. Two missed periods didn't really mean anything for a woman like me who was so irregular. I might not be pregnant. It might be just another false alarm. And if it wasn't, I prayed I'd have the strength to go through with an abortion. I didn't need a baby in my life. I knew once I had a child, he or she would become the center of my world, and Louvre would once again spoil a ballerina who could have been the best. Ballet music was in my head when I drove Chris's car to visit Madame Marisha one hot spring day, when all the world seemed sleepy and lazy, except for those idiot children being instructed by a shrill little bat wearing black as always. I sat in the shadows near the far wall of a huge auditorium and watched the large class of boys and girls dance. It was scary to think of how soon those girls would grow up to replace the stars of the present. Then I too would become another Madame Marisha, and the years would flow like seconds until I was Madame Zolta, and all my beauty would be preserved only in old, faded photographs. Catherine! called Madame M. joyfully when she spied me. She came striding swiftly, gracefully my way. Why do you sit in shadows? she asked. How nice to see your lovely face again. And don't think I don't know why you look so sad. You are one big fool to leave Julien. He's a big baby. You know he can't be left alone or he does things to hurt himself. And when he hurts himself, he hurts you too. Why did you let him get control of management? Why did you let him burn up your money as fast as it hits your pockets? I tell you this, in your place I would never, never have let him put another in my role of Giselle. God, what a blabbermouth she was. Don't worry about me, madame, I said coolly. If my husband doesn't want me for his partner any more, I'm sure there will be others who will. She scowled, advanced. She put those bony hands on me and shook me as if to wake me up. Up close I could see she'd aged terribly since Georges had died. Her ebony hair was almost white now and streaked with charcoal. She snarled then, baring teeth whiter than they used to be and far more perfect. You gonna let my son make a fool of you? You let him put another dancer in your place? I gave you credit for having more backbone. Now you hightail it back to New York and push that Yolanda out of his life. Marriage is sacred and wedding vows are meant to be kept. Then she softened and said, Come now, Catherine, and led me into her small, cluttered office. Now you tell me about this foolishness going on between you and your husband. It is really none of your business. She swung another straight chair to where she could straddle it. Leaning forward upon her arms, she stabbed me with her hard, penetrating glare. Anything and everything concerning my son is my business, she snapped. Now you just sit there and keep quiet, and let me tell you what you don't know about your husband. Her voice turned a little kinder. I was older than Georges when we were married, and even so I dared putting off having a child until I believed the best of my career was behind me, and then I became pregnant. Georges never wanted a child to hold him down and back, and so from the beginning Julien had two strikes against him. I tell myself we didn't force the dance upon our son, but we did keep him with us, so the ballet became part of his world, the most important part. She sighed heavily and wiped a bony hand over her troubled brow. We were strict with him, I admit that. We did everything we could to make him what was perfect in our eyes, but the more we tried, the more determined he became to be everything we didn't want him to be. We tried to teach him perfect diction, so he ended up mocking us with all kinds of vulgar street language, 
gutter talk, George called it. You know, she went on with a wistful expression, only after my husband was dead and buried did I realize that he never spoke to our son unless it was an order not to do something or an order to improve his dancing technique. I never realized that Georges could have been jealous of his own son, seeing that he was a better dancer and would achieve more fame. It wasn't easy for me to become only a ballet mistress and for Georges to be only an instructor. Many a night we lay on our bed and held to each other, craving the applause, the adulation. It was a hunger that would not be satisfied until we heard the applause for our son. Again she paused and bird-like craned her neck to peer at me and see if I was paying full attention. Oh, yes, she had my attention. She was telling me so much I needed to know. Julien tried to hurt Georges, and Georges got hurt because Julien made light of his father's reputation. One day he called him only a second-class performer. Georges didn't speak to his own son for a whole month. They never got back together after that. Farther and farther they drifted apart, until one fine Christmas day when another prodigy drifted into our lives and offered herself. You! Julian had flown back to visit us only because I had pleaded with him to try and make it up with his father. And Julian saw you. It is our responsibility to pass along our skills of technique to the younger generation. And still I felt some apprehension in taking you on, mostly because I thought you would hurt my son. I don't know why I thought that, but it seemed obvious from the very start it was that older doctor you loved. Then I thought you had something very rare, a passion for the dance that is seldom seen. You were, in your own way, equal to what Julian was. And the two of you together were so sensational I couldn't believe my eyes. My son felt it too, the rapport between you two. You turned those big, soft, admiring blue eyes on him. So later he came and told me you were a sex kitten who would fall easily under his spell and into his arms. He and I always had a close relationship, and he confessed to me what other boys would have kept secret. She paused flicked her stony eyes over me and went on breathlessly. You came, you admired him, you loved him when you were dancing with him, and when you weren't, you were indifferent. The harder you were to win, the more determined he was to have you. I thought you clever, playing a skillful woman's game when you were only a child. And now you, you, you go and leave him when he was in a foreign country where he couldn't speak the language when you should have learned he has weaknesses, many of them, and that he cannot bear to be alone. She jumped up like a black, scrawny alley cat and stood above me. Without Julian to give you inspiration and enhance your talent with his own, where would you be? Without him, would you be in New York, dancing with what is fast becoming one of the leading ballet companies? No, you'd be here raising babies for that doctor, God knows why you said yes to Julian and how you can keep from loving him, for he tells me you don't and never have. So you drug him, you leave him, you take off to see your brother become a doctor when you know damn well your place is at your husband's side, making him happy and taking care of his wants. Yes, yes, she shrilled. He called me long distance and told me everything. Now he thinks he hates you. Now he wants to cut you off. And when he does, he won't have a heart left to keep him alive for he gave you his heart years and years ago. Slowly I rose to my feet. My legs felt weak and trembly. I brushed a hand over my aching forehead and held back tired tears. All of a sudden it hit me hard. I did love Julian. Now I saw how very much we were alike, him with his hate for his father who had denied him as a son, and me with my hatred for my mother, making me do crazy things like sending off hateful letters and Christmas cards to sadden her life and never, never let her find peace. Julian in competition with his father, never knowing he'd won and was better, and me in competition with my mother. But I had yet to prove myself better. Madame, I'm going to tell you something Julian might not know, and I didn't really know until today. 
I do love your son. Perhaps I always loved him and just couldn't accept it. She shook her head, then fired her words like bullets. If you love him, why did you leave him? Answer me that. You left him because you found out he has a liking for young girls? Fool! All men have yearnings for young girls, but still they go on loving their wives. If you let his desire for young flesh drive you away, you are crazy. Slap his face. Kick his behind. Tell him to leave those girls alone or you will divorce him. Say all of that and he will be what you want. But when you say nothing and act like you don't care, you tell him plainly you don't love him or want him or need him. I'm not his mother or a priest or God, I said wearily, sick of all the passion she used. Backing toward the door, I tried to leave. I don't know if I can keep Julian from young girls, but I'm willing to go back and try. I promise to do better. I'll be more understanding, and I'll let him know I love him so much I can't abide the thought of him making love to anyone but me. She came to take me in her arms. She soothed, Poor baby, if I have been hard on you, it was for your own good. You have to keep my son from destroying himself. When you save him, you save yourself. For I lied when I said you would be nothing without Julian. He is the one who would be nothing without you. He has a death wish, always I've known it. He thinks he's not good enough to live on because his father could never convince him he was. And that was my fault, too, as well as George's. Julian waited for years and years for his father to see him as a son worthy of being loved for himself. He waited equally as long for Georges to say, Yes, you will be even a better dancer than I was, and I'm proud of what and who you are. But Georges kept his silence. But you go back and tell Julian Georges did love him. To me, he said it many times. Tell him, too, that his father was proud of him. Tell him, Catherine. Go back and convince him of how much you need and love him. Tell him how sorry you are to have left him alone. Go quickly before he does something terrible to himself. It was time to say goodbye to Carrie, Paul and Henny again. Only this time I didn't have to bid adieu to Chris. He put his foot down. No, I'm coming with you. I'm not letting you go back to a crazy man. When you've made your peace with him and I know everything is all right, only then will I leave. Carrie cried, as she always did, and Paul stood back and let only his eyes speak and say, Yes, I could find a place in his heart again. I looked down as the plane began to lift and saw Paul holding Carrie's small hand as she tilted her face to stare up at us and waved and waved until we could see her no more. I squirmed into a comfortable position and put my head on Chris's shoulder and told him to wake me when we reached New York. A fine travelling companion you make, he grumbled. But soon his cheek was on my hair as he dozed off too. Chris, I said sleepily, remember that book about Raymond and Lily who were always seeking the magical place where purple grass grew that would fulfill all their wishes? Wouldn't it be wonderful to look down and see purple grass? Yeah, he said, as sleepily as I. I keep looking for it, too. The plane set down at LaGuardia around three. A hot, sultry day. The sun played coy, darting in and out of gathering storm clouds. We were both tired. At this hour, Julian will be in the theatre rehearsing. They'll use the rehearsals as a promotion film. There have to be a lot of rehearsals. We've never danced in this theatre before and it's important to get the feel of the space you have to move in. Chris was lugging along my two heavy suitcases while I carried his much lighter bag. I laughed and smiled his way, glad he was with me, though Julian would be furious. Now you stay in the background, and don't let him even see you if everything goes all right. Really, Chris, I'm sure he'll be glad to see me. He's not dangerous. Sure, he said glumly. We sauntered on into the darkened theatre. The stage up ahead was very brightly lit. The TV cameras were in position, ready to shoot the warm-ups. The director, producer and a few others were lined up in the front row seats. The heat of the day was chased by the chill of the huge space. Chris opened up one of my bags and spread a sweater about my shoulders after we both sat down near the aisle midway back in the centre section. 
Automatically, I lifted both my legs to stretch them on top of the seat just ahead. Though I shivered, the corps de ballet were sweating from the hot Klieg lights. The eye was down and a few flats were up. I looked for Julian but didn't see him. Just to think of Julian was to bring him out of the wings, onto the stage in a series of whirling jetés. Oh, he looked terrific in that snug white leotard with bright green leg warmers. Wow, whispered Chris in my ear. Sometimes I forget how sensational he is on stage. No wonder every ballet critic thinks he will be the star of this decade when he learns some discipline. Let it be soon. And I mean you too, Kathy. I smiled, for I too needed discipline. Yes, I said. I too, of course. No sooner had Julian finished his solo performance than Yolanda Lang pirouetted out from the wings wearing red. She was more beautiful than ever. She danced extraordinarily well for a girl so tall. That was, she danced well until Julian came to partner her, and then everything went wrong. He reached for her waist and got her buttocks. Then he had to quickly shift his hold, so she slipped and nearly fell, and again he adjusted to save her. A male dancer who let a ballerina fall would soon never have a partner to lift. They tried again, the same jump, lift, and fall back, and this time it went almost as awkwardly, making Yolanda seem ungainly and Julian unskilled. Even I, sitting halfway down the row of seats, could hear her loud curse. Damn you, she screeched. You make me look gauche. If you let me fall, I'll see you never dance again. Cut, called the director, getting to his feet and looking impatiently from one to the other. The corps de ballet milled about, grumbling, throwing angry looks at the pair center stage that was wasting so much time. Obviously, from the sweaty, hot looks of all of them, this had been going on for some time, and badly. Marquette, called the director, well known for having little patience for those who required two or even more takes. What the hell is wrong with your timing? I thought you said you knew this ballet. I can't think of one thing you've done right in the past three days. Me? Julian railed back. It's not me, it's her. She jumps too soon. Okay, the director said sarcastically. It's always her fault and never yours. He tried to control his impatience, knowing Julian would walk out in a second if criticized too much. When is your wife going to be well enough to dance again? Yolanda screamed out. Hey, wait a minute. I came all the way from Los Angeles, and now you're sounding as if you're going to replace me with Catherine. I won't have it. I'm written into that contract now. I'll sue. Miss Lang, said the director smoothly, you are the cover only. But while you are, let's attempt it again. Marquette, listen for your cue. Lang, make ready. And pray to God, this time it will be fit to show an audience who might expect better from professionals. I smiled to hear she was only the cover. I had thought I was really written out. I perversely enjoyed watching Julian make a fool out of himself and Yolanda as well. Yet when the dancers on stage groaned, I groaned along with them, feeling their exhaustion. And despite myself, I began to feel pity for Julian, who was diligently trying to balance Yolanda. Any second the director could call, take ten, and that's when I would make my move. Up ahead, first row, Madame Zolta suddenly turned her wizened giraffe neck to crane my way, and those sharp little beady eyes saw me sitting tensely, watching like an eagle. "'Hey, you, Catherine!' she called with great enthusiasm. "'Come!' she gestured. "'Sit by my side.' "'Excuse me a minute, Chris,' I whispered. "'I've got to go up there and save Julian before he ruins both our careers. "'I'll be all right. "'There's not much he can do with an audience, is there?' "'Once I was seated beside Madame Zolta, she hissed, so, you're not so sick after all. Thank God for small favors. Your husband up there is ruining my reputation along with his and yours. I should have known better than to always let him partner you, so now he can dance with no one as well. Madame, I asked, who arranged for Yolanda to be my stand-in? Your husband, my love, she whispered cruelly. You let him get control. You were a fool to do that. It is impossible. He is a tempest, a devil so unreasonable. Soon he will go mad if he doesn't see your face, or we will go mad. 
Now run fast and put on dance clothes and save me from extinction. It was only a matter of seconds before I had on a practice outfit, and as soon as I had my hair bound up and securely fastened in place, I strapped on my points. At the dressing room bar, I warmed up quickly, doing my plies and the horn de jambe to pump blood into each limb. Soon enough, I was ready. Not a day passed I didn't do my exercises for several hours. In the darkened wings, I hesitated. I was prepared, I thought, for most anything when Julian saw me. What would he do? While I watched him on stage, suddenly from behind I was brutally shoved aside. You've been replaced, hissed Yolanda. So get out and stay out. You had your chance and loused it up. Now Julian is mine, you hear that? He's mine. I have slept in your bed and used your makeup and worn your jewelry. I have taken your place in everything. I wanted to ignore her and not believe anything she said. When the cue came for Giselle to go on, Yolanda tried to hold me. That's when I turned savagely upon her and pushed her so hard she fell. She blanched with pain while I went on point and glided onto the stage, making my perfect little string of pearls. Each tiny step could have been measured and proven to be of an exact distance. I was the shy young village girl, sweetly, sincerely falling in love with Lois. Others on stage gasped to see me. A relief lit up Julian's dark eyes for an instant. Hi, he said coolly as I neared him and fluttered my dark lashes to enchant him more. Why'd you come back? Your doctor kick you out? Sick of you already? You are a nasty, inconsiderate brute, Julian, to replace me with Yolanda. You know I despise her. His back was to the lookers as he sneered wickedly, all the while keeping time. Yeah, I know you hate her. That's why I wanted her. He curled his beautiful red lips so they looked ugly. Listen to this dancing doll. Nobody runs out on me, especially my wife, and comes back and thinks she can still fit in my life. My love, my dearest heart, I don't want you now. I don't need you now. And you can go and play bitch to any man you want. Get the hell out of my life. You don't mean that, I said, as we both performed perfectly and no one called cut. How could they when we did everything so exquisitely right? You don't love me, he said bitterly. You've never loved me, no matter what I did or what I said. And now I don't give a damn. I gave you the best I had to give, and it wasn't enough. So, dear Catherine, I give you this. And with those sudden words, he broke the routine, jumped high into the air to come down forcefully and directly onto my feet. All his weight brought down like a battering ram to crush my toes. I uttered some small cry of pain. Then Julian was whirling back to chuck me under the chin. Now, love, see who will dance Giselle with me. Certainly it won't be you, will it? Take ten, bellowed the director, too late to save me. Julian gripped my shoulders and shook me like a rag doll. I stared at him, rattle-eyed, expecting anything. Then suddenly he whirled away, leaving me center stage alone, on two damaged feet that hurt so badly I could have screamed. Instead, I sank to the floor and sat there, staring at my rapidly swelling feet. From out of the darkened auditorium, Chris came running to my assistance. "'Damn him to hell for doing this!' he cried, falling on his knees to take off my point shoes and examine my feet. Tenderly, he tried to move my toes, but I cried out from the awful pain. Then he picked me up easily and held me tight against him. "'You'll be all right, Kathy. I'll see that your toes heal properly.' I fear a few are broken on each foot. You'll need an orthopedist. Take Catherine to our orthopedist, ordered Madame Zolta, who teetered forward and stared at my darkening, enlarging feet. She peered more closely at Chris, having seen him only a few times before. You Catherine's brother who caused all this trouble? she asked. Take her quick to the doctor. We have insurance. But that fool husband, this is it. I fire him. Chapter 23 The Thirteenth Dancer Both of my feet were X-rayed, disclosing three broken toes on my left foot and one broken small toe on my right. 
Thank God both my big toes were spared, or else I might never dance again. An hour later, Chris was carrying me out of the doctor's office with a plaster cast drying on one foot that reached to my knee, while the small toe was only taped and left to heal without such protection. Each of the toes in the cast was nestled securely in its own little padded compartment, so I couldn't move a one, and left exposed for everyone to admire the lovely shades of black, blue, and purple. In my thoughts, the sour lemon drops of the doctor's last words failed to melt and sweeten the future. You may or you may not dance again, it all depends. On what it depended, he didn't say. So I asked Chris. Sure, he said confidently. Of course you'll dance again. Sometimes a doctor likes to be overly pessimistic, so you can think how great he was when everything works out fine due to his special skill. Clumsily, he tried to support me while he used my key to open the door of the apartment Julian and I shared. Then he carefully lifted me up again, carried me inside, and kicked the door closed behind him. He tried to make me as comfortable as possible on one of the soft couches. I had my eyes squeezed tightly together, trying to suppress the pain I felt at every move. Chris tenderly supported both legs so he could stuff pillows under and keep them elevated to reduce the swelling. Another fat pillow was carefully eased under my back and head, and he never said one word. Not one word. Because he was so silent, I opened my eyes and studied his face that loomed above me. He tried to look professional, detached, but he failed. He showed shock each time his eyes moved from one object to another. Fearful, I looked around. My eyes bulged, my mouth opened. This room, the mess. Oh, God, it was awful. Our apartment was a wreck. Every painting Julian and I had so carefully selected was torn down from the walls, smashed on the floor. Even the two watercolours Chris had painted especially for me, portraits with me in costume. All the expensive bric-a-brac lay broken on the hearth. Lamps were on the floor, the shades slashed to ribbons and the wire frames bent. Needlepoint pillows I'd made during the long, tedious flights from here to there while on tour were ripped, destroyed. House plants had been dumped from their pots and left with roots exposed to die. Two cloissonne vases that Paul had given as a wedding gift, gone too. Everything fine and costly and very cherished. Things he and I had planned to keep all our lives and leave to our children. All beyond restoration. Vandals, said Chris softly. Just vandals. He smiled and kissed my forehead and squeezed my hand as tears came to my eyes. Stay calm, he said. Then he went to check the other three rooms, while I sank back on the pillows and sniffed back my sobs. Oh, how he must hate me to do this. Shortly, Chris was back with his expression very composed, in that same eye of the hurricane way I'd seen a few times on his face. Kathy, he began, settling cautiously down on the edge of the sofa and reaching for my hand. I don't know what to think. All your clothes and shoes have been ruined. Your jewellery is scattered all over the bedroom floor. The chains ripped apart, the rings stepped on, bracelets hammered out of shape. It looks as if somebody set out deliberately to ruin all of your things and left Julian's in perfect condition. He gave me a baffled, troubled look, and maybe the tears I tried to hold back jumped from my eyes to his. With glistening blue eyes, he extended his palm to show me the setting of a once exquisite diamond engagement ring given to me by Paul. The platinum band was now a crooked oval. The prongs had released their clasp on the clear and perfect two-carat diamond. Sedatives had been shot into my arm, so I couldn't feel the pain of my broken toes. I felt fuzzy and disoriented and rather detached. Someone inside me was screaming, screaming. Hatred was near again. The wind was blowing. And when I closed my eyes, I saw the blue-misted mountains all around me, shutting out the sun, like upstairs, like in the attic. Julian, I said weakly, he must have done this. He must have come back and vented his rage on all my belongings. See the things left whole? They are things he chose for himself. Damn him to hell, said Chris. How many times has he vented his rage on you? How many black eyes? I've seen one, but how many others? 
Please don't, I said, sleepily, hazily. He never hit me that he didn't cry afterward and he'd say he was sorry. Yes, so sorry, my sweetheart, my only love. I don't know what makes me act as I do when I love you so much. Kathy, began Chris tentatively, tucking the platinum band in his pocket. Are you all right? You look close to fainting. I'll go in and straighten up the bed so you can rest in that. Soon you'll fall asleep and forget all of this, and when you wake up I'm taking you away. Don't cry for the clothes and things he gave you, for I'll give you better and more. As for this ring Paul gave you, I'll search around the bedroom until I find the diamond. He looked, but he didn't find the diamond, and when I drifted into sleep he must have carried me to the bed he'd made up with clean sheets. I was under a sheet and a thin blanket when I opened my eyes, and he was sitting on the edge of the bed watching my face. I glanced toward the windows and saw it was getting dark. Any moment Julian would come home and find Chris with me and there'd be hell to pay. Chris, did you undress me and put on this gown? I asked dully, seeing the sleeve of a blue gown that was one of my favourites. Yes, I thought you'd be more comfortable than wearing that pantsuit with the legs split up the seam. And I'm a doctor, remember. I'm used to seeing all there is, and I took care not to look. The darkness of late twilight was in the room, turning all the shadows soft and purplish. Fuzzily, I saw him as he used to be, when the attic atmosphere was like this, purplish, dim, scary, and we were alone and facing some unknown horror ahead. Always he gave me comfort when nothing else could. Always he was there when I needed him to do and say the right thing. Remember the day Mama received the letter from the grandmother saying we could stay in her home? We thought wonderful things were ahead of us then. We later thought all joy lay in the past. Never, never in the present. Yes, he said softly. I remember. We believed we'd be rich as King Midas, and everything we touched would turn to gold. Only we'd have more self-control, enough to keep those we loved still made of flesh and blood. We were young and silly then, and so trusting. Silly? I don't think we were silly, only normal. You've achieved your goal of being a doctor. But I'm still not a prima ballerina. I said this last bitterly. Kathy, don't belittle yourself. You will be a prima ballerina yet, he said fervently. You would have been a long time ago, if Julian could control his fits of temper that makes every company manager afraid to sign the pair of you on. You get stuck in a minor company just because you won't leave him. I sighed, wishing he hadn't said that. It was true enough Julian's fiery temper tantrums had scared off more than one offer that would have placed us in a more prestigious company. You've got to leave, Chris. I don't want him to come home and find you here. He doesn't want you near me. And I can't leave him. In his own way, he loves me and needs me. Without me to keep him steady, he would be ten times more violent. And I do love him, after all. If he struck out sometimes, he was just trying to make me see that. Now I do see. See, he cried. You're not seeing. You're letting pity for him rob you of good common sense. Look around you, Kathy. Only a crazy man could have done this. I'm not leaving you alone to face a madman. I'm staying to protect you. Tell me what you could do if he decides to make you pay again for leaving him alone in Spain. Could you get up and run? No. I'm not leaving you here unprotected, when he might come home drunk or on drugs. He doesn't use drugs, I defended, protective of the good that was in Julian, and for some reason wanting to forget all that wasn't. He jumped on your toes when you need those toes to dance on, so don't tell me you will have a sane man to deal with. When you were putting on your clothes, I overheard someone say that since Julian started running around with Yolanda, he's been an entirely different man. Everyone else suspects he's on drugs, that's why I said it. And here he paused. And besides, I know for a fact that Yolanda takes anything she can get. I was sleepy, in pain and worried about Julian, who should be home by now, and there was an incipient baby in me whose fate I had to decide. Chris, stay then, but when he comes home, let me do the talking. Just fade into the background. Promise? 
He nodded while I began to drift off again, feeling as if nothing was real but the bed underneath me and the sleep I needed. Lazily, without thought, I tried to turn on my side, and my legs slipped from the heaped pillows, making me cry out. Kathy, don't move, said Chris, quickly adjusting my legs back on the pillows. Let me lie beside you and hold you until he comes. I promise not to sleep, and the minute he comes through that door I'll jump up and fade away. He smiled to charm me into cheer again, so I too nodded and welcomed the warm, strong arms he put around me as again I sought the sweet relief of sleep. As in a dream I felt soft lips move on my cheek, in my hair, then lightly over my eyelids and finally my lips. I love you so much. Oh, God, how much I love you, I heard him say. And I thought for a disoriented moment it was Julian who'd come home to say he was sorry for hurting and humiliating me, for this was his way, to give me pain and then apologize and make love with passionate abandon. So I turned a bit on my side and responded to his kisses and put my arms around him and twined my fingers into his strong, dark hair. That's when I knew. The hair, I felt, wasn't strong and crisp, but silky and fine like my own. Chris, I cried out. Stop! But he was out of control as he lavished my face, my neck, and the bosom he bared with his ardent kisses. Don't cry, stop, he murmured, caressing and stroking me. All my life I've had nothing but frustrations. I try to love others, but it's always you, you whom I can never have. Kathy, leave, Julian. Come away with me. We'll go to some distant place where no one knows us, and together we can live as man and wife. We won't have any children, I'll see to that. We can adopt babies. You know we make good parents. You know we love each other and always will. Nothing can change that. You can run from me and marry twelve other men, but your heart is in your eyes when you look at me. It's me you want as I want you. He was carried away with his own persuasions and wouldn't listen to my weak words. Kathy, just to hold you, to have you again. This time I'll know how to give you the pleasure I couldn't before. Please, if you ever loved me, leave Julian before he destroys us both. I shook my head, trying to focus on what he was saying and what he was doing. His blonde hair was beneath my chin, nuzzling at my breasts, and he didn't see my denial, but he did hear my voice. Christopher, I'm going to have Julian's baby. I went to a gynecologist while I was in Claremont. It's the reason I stayed longer than I originally intended. Julian and I are having a baby. I could have slapped him from the way he moved backward, abandoning the sweet ecstasy of kissing forbidden places that had aroused me. He sat up on the side of the bed and bowed his head into his hands. Then he sobbed. Always you managed to defeat me, Kathy. First Paul, then Julian, and now a baby. Then suddenly he faced me. Come away and let me be the father to that child. Julian isn't fit. If you never let me touch you, let me live near enough so I can see you every day and hear your voice. Sometimes I want it back like it used to be. Just you and I and our twins. Silence that we both knew well came and took us and shut us away in our own secret world where sin lived and unholy thoughts dwelled and we'd pay, pay, pay if ever. But no, there wouldn't be any if ever. Chris, I'm going to have the baby with Julian, I said with a firm resolution that surprised me. I want Julian's child. For I do love him, Chris, and I've failed him in so many ways. Failed him because you and Paul got in my eyes and I didn't appreciate what I could have had in him. I should have been a better wife, and then he wouldn't have needed those girls. I'll always love you, but it's a love that can't go anywhere, so I give it up. You give it up. Say goodbye to yesterday's and a Catherine doll who doesn't exist any more. You forgive him for breaking your toes, he asked, astonished. He kept begging me to say I loved him and I never would. I kept a deceptive parasol over my head to keep dark doubts in my mind and I refused to see anything that was noble and fine about him but his dancing. I didn't realize that to love me even when I denied him was noble and fine in itself. So let me go, Chris. 
Even if I never dance again, I'll have his child, and he will go on to fame without me. He slammed the door and left me, and I soon fell asleep to dream of Bart Winslow, my mother's second husband. We were waltzing in the grand ballroom of Foxworth Hall, and upstairs, near the balcony balustrade, two children were hidden inside the massive chest with the wire screen backing. The Christmas tree over in the corner towered up to heaven, and hundreds of people danced with us, but they were made of transparent cellophane, not of the healthy flesh, blood, and muscle that was the beauty of Bart and I. Bart suddenly stopped dancing and picked me up to carry me up the broad stairs, and down on the sumptuous swan bed he laid me. My beautiful gown of green velvet and softer green chiffon melted beneath the touch of his burning hands, and then that powerful male shaft that entered me and wound about me started shrieking, screaming, and each loud cry sounded exactly like a telephone ringing. I bolted awake. Why did a telephone ringing in the dead of night always have such a threatening sound? I sleepily reached for the receiver. Hello? Mrs. Julian Marquette? I came awake a bit more and rubbed at my eyes. Yes, this is she. She named a hospital on the other side of town. Mrs. Marquette, would you please come as quickly as possible? If you can, have someone else drive you. Your husband was in an auto accident and is even now in surgery. Bring with you his insurance papers, identification, and any medical history you have. Mrs. Marquette, are you there? No, I wasn't there. I was back in Gladstone, Pennsylvania, and I was twelve years old. Two state troopers were in the driveway with a white car parked, and swiftly they were striding to interrupt a birthday party to tell us all that Daddy was dead, killed in an accident on Greenfield Highway. Chris! Chris! I screamed, terrified he might have gone. I'm here. I'm coming. I knew you'd need me. In that dim and lonely hour that comes before dawn, Chris and I arrived at the hospital. In one of those sterile waiting rooms, we sat down to wait and find out if Julian would survive the accident and the surgery. Finally, around noon, after hours in the recovery room, they brought him down. They had him laid out on what they called a fracture bed, a torturous-looking device that strung up his right leg, which wore a cast from his toes to his hip. His left arm was broken and in a cast and strung up in a peculiar way, too. His pale face was lacerated and bruised. His lips, usually so full and red, were as pale as his skin. But all of that was nothing compared to his head. I shivered to look. His head had been shaved, and small holes drilled for metal calipers to be hooked in to pull his head up and backward. A leather collar lined with fleece was fastened about his neck. A broken neck, plus a leg fracture and a compound fracture of his forearm, to say nothing of the internal injuries that had kept him on the operating table three hours. I cried out, Will he live? He is on the critical list, Mrs. Marquette, they answered so calmly. If he has other close relatives, we suggest you contact them. Chris made the call to Madame Marisha, for I was deathly afraid he'd pass away any moment and I might miss the only chance to tell him I loved him, and if that happened I'd be cursed and haunted all through the rest of my life. Days passed. Julian flitted in and out of consciousness. He stared at me with eyes lacklustre, unfocused. He spoke, but his voice came so thick, heavy, and unintelligible I couldn't understand. I forgave him for all the little sins, and the big ones too, as you are apt to when death is around the corner. I rented a room in the hospital next to his where I could catch naps, but I never had a full night's rest. I had to be there when he came to, where he could see and know me, so I could plead with him to fight, to live, and most of all say all the words I'd so stingily kept from his ears. Julian, I whispered, my voice hoarse from saying it so often, please don't die. Our dancing friends and musicians flocked to the hospital to offer what consolation they could, his room filled with flowers from hundreds of fans. Madame Marisha flew up from South Carolina and stalked into the room wearing a dreary black dress. She gazed down on the unconscious face of her only child without any expression of grief. 
Better he die now, she said flatly, than to wake up and find himself a cripple for life. How dare you say that? I flared, ready to strike her. He's alive and he's not doomed. His spinal cord wasn't injured. He'll walk again and dance again, too. Then came the pity and disbelief to shimmer her jet eyes, and then she was in tears. She, who'd boasted she never cried, never showed grief, wept in my arms. Say it again that he'll dance. Oh, don't lie. He's got to dance again. Five horrible days came and went before Julian could focus his eyes enough to really see. Unable to turn his head, he rolled his eyes my way. Hi. Hello, dreamer. I thought you were never going to wake up, I said. He smiled, a thin, ironic smile. No such luck, Kathy, love. His eyes flicked downward to his strung-up leg. I'd rather be dead than like this. I got up and went to his fracture bed that was made with two wide strips of rough canvas slipped over strong rods, and a mattress was beneath this that could be lowered enough to allow a bedpan to be placed in position. It was a hard, unyielding bed to lie on, yet I stretched beside him very carefully and curled my fingers into his tangle of uncombed hair, what he had left. My free hand stroked his chest. Jewel, you're not paralyzed. Your spinal cord was not severed, crushed, or even bruised. It's just in shock, so to speak. He had an uninjured arm that could have reached to hold me, but it stayed straight at his side. You're lying, he said bitterly. I can't feel one damn thing from my waist down. Not your hand on my chest, either. Now get the hell out of here. You don't love me. You wait until you think I'm ready to kick off, and then you come with your sweet words. I don't want or need your pity, so get the hell out and stay out. I left his bed and reached for my purse, crying even as he cried and stared at the ceiling. Damn you for wrecking our apartment, I stormed when I could talk. You tore up my clothes, I rampaged, angry now and wanting to slap his face that was already bruised and swollen. Damn you for breaking all our beautiful things. You knew how painstakingly we chose all those lamps, the accessories that cost a fortune. You know we wanted to leave them as heirlooms for our children. Now we've got nothing left to leave anyone. He grinned, satisfied. Yeah, nothing left for nobody. He yawned as if dismissing me, but I was unwilling to be dismissed. Got no kids, thank God. Never going to have any. You can get a divorce. Marry some son of a bitch and make his life miserable, too. Julian, I said with such heavy sadness, have I made your life miserable? He blinked as if not wanting to answer that, but I asked him again and again until I forced him to say, Not altogether miserable. We had a few moments. Only a few? Well, maybe more than a few. But you don't have to stay on and take care of an invalid. Get the hell out while you can. I'm no good, you know that. I've been unfaithful to you time and again. If you are again, I'll cut your heart out. Go away, Kathy. I'm tired. He sounded sleepy from the many sedatives they fed into him and shot into him. Kids are not good for people like us, anyway. People like us? Yeah, people like us. How are we different? He mockingly, sleepily laughed, bitterly, too. We're not real. We don't belong to the human race. What are we, then? Dancing dolls, that's all. Dancing fools, afraid to be real people and live in the real world. That's why we prefer fantasy, didn't you know? No, I didn't know. I always thought we were real. It wasn't me who ruined your things. It was Yolanda. I watched, though. I felt sick scared he was telling the truth. Was I only a dancing doll? Couldn't I make my way in the real world outside the theatre? Wasn't I, after all, any better at coping than Mama? Julian, I do love you, honest I do. I used to think I loved someone else because it seemed so unnatural to go from one love to another. When I was a little girl, I used to believe love came only once in a lifetime, and that was the best kind. I thought once you loved one person, you never could love another, but I was wrong. 
Get out and leave me alone. I don't want to hear what you've got to say. Not now. Now I don't give a damn. Tears coursed my face and dropped down on him. He closed his eyes and refused to see or listen. I leaned to kiss his lips and they stayed tight, hard, unresponding. Next he spat. Stop! You sicken me. I love you, Julian, I sobbed. And I'm sorry if I realized it too late and said it too late. But don't let it be too late. I'm expecting your baby, the fourteenth in a long line of dancers. And that baby is a lot to live for, even if you don't love me any more. Don't close your eyes and pretend not to hear, because you are going to be a father, whether or not you want to be. He rolled his dark, shining eyes my way, and I saw why they shone, for they were full of tears. Tears of self-pity or tears of frustration, I didn't know. But he spoke more kindly, and there was a tone of love in his voice. I advise you to get rid of it, Kathy. Fourteen is no luckier a number than thirteen. In the room next door, Chris held me in his arms all through the night. I woke up early in the morning. Yolanda had been thrown from the car in that accident, and today she would be buried. Cautiously, I eased from the fold of Chris's arms, and I arranged his nodding head more comfortably before I stole away to take a peek into Julian's room. He had a night nurse on duty, and she was sound asleep beside his bed. I stood in the doorway and watched him in the dim greenish light from the lamp covered by a green towel. He was asleep, deeply asleep. The intravenous tube that led to his arm ran under the sheet and into his vein. For some reason I fixed my eyes upon that bottle with the pale yellow liquid that seemed more water than anything else, so quickly it was being depleted. I ran back to shake Chris awake. Chris, I said, as he tried to pull himself together, isn't that IV supposed to just trickle into his arm? It's running out very quickly, too quickly, I think. Hardly were the words out of my mouth when Chris was up and running toward Julian's room. He snapped on the ceiling light as he entered, then wakened the sleeping nurse. Damn you for falling asleep. You were in here to watch him. By the time he had that said, he'd pulled back the covers, and there was Julian's casted arm with the opening for the needle, and the needle was still inserted and taped in position, but the tube had been cut. Oh, God, sighed Chris. An air bubble must have reached his heart. I stared at the shiny scissors held so loosely in Julian's slack right hand. He cut the tube himself, I whispered. He cut the tube himself, and now he's dead. 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 Where did he get the scissors? snapped Chris while the nurse began to tremble. They were her small embroidery scissors she used to cut her crochet thread. They must have fallen out of my pocket, she said weakly. I swear I don't remember losing them. Or maybe he took them when I was leaning over. It's all right, I said dully. If he hadn't done it this way, it would have been another. I should have known and warned you. There was no life for him if he could never dance again. No life at all. Julian was buried next to his father. On the headstone, I made sure Madame Marisha agreed to the name I added. Julian Marquette Rosenkopf, beloved husband of Catherine and thirteenth in a long line of Russian male ballet stars. Maybe it was ostentatious and gave away my own failure to love him enough while he lived, but I had to let him have it the way he wanted, or as I thought he wanted. Chris, Paul, Carrie and I paused at the foot of Georges' grave too, and I bowed my head to show respect to Julian's father. Respect I should have given him, too. Graveyards with their marble saints, angels, all so sweetly smiling, so pious or sober. How I hated them. They patronized we who lived, we who were made of fragile tissue and blood, who could grieve and cry while they would stand there for centuries, smiling piously down on all. And I was right back where I'd started. Catherine, said Paul, when we were all seated in the long black limousine, your room is still as it was, all yours. Come home and live with Carrie and me until your baby is born. Chris will be there, too, doing his internship at Claremont Hospital. 
I stared over at Chris, who was seated on the jump seat, knowing he'd won a much better position in a very important hospital, and he was interning in a small, unimportant one. Duke is so far away, Kathy, he said, with his eyes avoiding mine. It was bad enough travelling when I was in college and med school. So if you don't mind, let me be somewhere near so I can be here the day my nephew or niece arrives in the world. Madame Marisha jolted so her head almost struck the ceiling of the car. You carry Julian's child, she cried. Why didn't you tell me before? How wonderful! She glowed so the sadness dropped from her like a gloomy cloak. Now Julian's not dead at all, for he will father a son who will be exactly like him. It may be a girl, madame, Paul said softly while he reached for my hand. I know you long for a boy like your son, but I long for a little girl like Kathy and Carrie. But if it's a boy, I won't object. Object? cried madame. God in his infinite wisdom and mercy will send to Catherine the exact duplicate of Julien, and he will dance and he will reach the fame that was waiting just around the corner for the son of my Georges. Midnight found me all alone on the back veranda, rocking back and forth in Paul's favourite chair. My head was full of thoughts for the future. Thoughts of the past conflicted and nearly drowned me. The floorboards squeaked faintly. They were old and had known grief like mine before. They sympathized. The stars and moon were out. Even a few fireflies came to bob about in the garden darkness. The door behind me opened and closed quietly. I didn't look to see who it was, for I knew I was good at sensing people, even in the dark. He sat in the chair next to mine and rocked his chair in the same rhythm as I rocked. Kathy he said softly. I hate to see you sitting there with that lost and drained expression. Don't think all the good things in your life have passed you by and nothing is left. You're still very young, very beautiful, and after your baby is born you can quickly whip yourself back into shape and dance until you feel you're ready to retire and teach. I didn't turn my head. Dance again? How could I dance when Julian lay in the ground? All I had was the baby. I would make the baby the center of my life. I would teach my child to dance, and he or she would reach the fame that should have been Julian's and mine. Everything that Mama failed to give us I would bestow on my child. Never would my child be neglected. When my child reached for me, I would be there. When my child cried out for Mama, he wouldn't have to make do with only an older sister. No, I'd be like Mama was when she had Daddy. That was what hurt the most, that she could change from someone loving and kind into what she was, a monster. Never, never would I treat my child as she'd treated hers. Good night, Paul, I said as I stood to go. Don't stay out here too long. You have to get up early and you looked tired at dinner. Catherine? Not now. Later. I need time. Slowly I ascended the back stairs, thinking of the baby in my womb how I had to be careful and not eat junk food. I had to drink plenty of milk, take vitamins, and think happy thoughts, not vengeful ones. Every day from now on I would play ballet music. Inside me my baby would hear, and even before he or she was born, a small living soul would be indoctrinated to the dance. I smiled, thinking of all the pretty tutus I could buy for my little girl. I smiled even more to think of a boy like his father with a wild tumble of dark curls. Julian Janus Marquette would be his name. Janus for looking both ways, ahead and behind. I passed Chris, who was ready to come down the stairs. He touched me. I shivered, knowing what he wanted. He didn't have to say the words. I knew them backward and forward, inside and out, upside down or right side up. I knew them as I knew him. Though I tried diligently to think only of the innocent child growing within me, still my thoughts would steal to my mother, filling me with hate, filling me with unwanted plans for revenge. For somehow she had caused Julian's death too. If we'd never been locked away in the first place and needed to escape and run, then I would never have loved Chris or Paul, and perhaps Julian and I would have met inevitably in New York. 
and then I could have loved him as he needed and wanted to be loved. I could have gone to him virgin, pure, brand new. And would that have made any difference? I asked over and over. Yes. Yes, I convinced myself it would have made all the difference. Chapter 24 Interlude for Three As my baby grew within me, I began to find the identity I had lost, for the ballet kept the real me always in an embryo state, enclosed by my desire to dance and succeed. I was now standing firmly on the ground, with the fantasy of glamorous life pushed to the background. Not that I didn't still crave the stage and the applause now and then. Oh, I had my sorrowful moments, but I had one sure way to shut them out. I turned my thoughts on my mother, on what she'd done to us. Another death on your record, Mama. Dear Mrs. Winslow, are you still running away from me? Don't you know yet you can never run fast enough or far enough? Some day I will catch up and we will meet again. Perhaps this time you will suffer as you made me suffer, and hopefully thrice the amount. My husband has just died as the result of a car accident, just as your husband died many years ago. I am expecting his baby, but I won't do anything as desperate as you did. I will find a way to support him or her, even if I have triplets or quadruplets. I mailed that letter off, addressed to her home in Green Glenna, but the newspapers later informed me she was in Japan. Japan? Wow, she did get about. I was turning into a woman I'd never seen before. Mirrors showed me I wasn't slim and supple any more. That terrified me. I saw my breasts become rounder, fuller, as my middle swelled outward. I hated to move less than gracefully but my hands loved to caress the swell of my baby's small rump. One day I realized I was luckier than most widows. I had two men needing me, men who let me know in subtle ways they were ready to take Julian's place. And I had Carrie, Carrie who considered me a model by which she could mold her own life. Dear sweet little Carrie, who was now sixteen and had never had a date or a boyfriend or been to a prom, not that she couldn't have if she'd forget her smallness. Chris persuaded his friends to date a younger sister who was dying on the vine for want of romance. She complained to me, Chris doesn't have to make dates for you. That college student, he doesn't want me. He just comes to worm in closer to you. I laughed at how ridiculous that was. Nobody would want me in the condition I was, pregnant, a widow, and too old for a college boy. Carrie heard this, but sulked near the window. Since you came back, Dr. Paul doesn't take me out to the movies and to dinner like he used to. I used to pretend he wasn't my guardian, but my sweetheart, and that made me feel good inside, because all the ladies look at him, Kathy. He is handsome, even if he is old. I sighed, for to me, Paul would never be old. He was wonderfully young-looking for his age of forty-eight. I took Carrie in my arms and consoled her, saying love was waiting for her just around the corner. He'll be young to Carrie, near your own age, and once he sees you and really knows what you are, he won't have to be coerced. He'll be more than willing to love you. Quietly she got up and entered her own room, not convinced by anything I'd said. Madame Marisha came often to check on my condition and filled me with authoritative advice. Now you keep up your practicing. Play the ballet music to fill Julian's baby with love for beauty before he is born. Inside you he'll know the dance is waiting for him. She glanced down at my feet that had finally healed. How do those toes feel now? Fine, I answered dully, though they ached when it rained. Henny was there to wait on me hand and foot when Carrie wasn't around. She was growing old amazingly fast. I worried about her. She diligently tried to keep to the rigid diet both her doctor sons insisted on, but she ate what she wanted to, never counting calories or cholesterol. The long days of grief sped by more quickly because I had Julian's baby, part of him to keep with me. Soon Christmas was upon us, and I was so large I didn't feel I should show myself. 
Chris insisted, along with Paul, that it would be good therapy to go shopping. I bought an antique gold locket to send to Madame Zalter, and inside I put two small photos of Julian and I in our Romeo and Juliet costumes. Shortly after Christmas, her thank-you note arrived. Dear Catherine, my own love, yours is the best gift of all. I grieve for your beautiful dancing husband. I grieve for you most of all if you decide not to dance again just because you are to become mother. Long ago you would have been a prima ballerina if your husband had shown less arrogance and more respect for those in authority. Keep in shape, do exercises, bring your baby with you, and we will all live together in my place until you find new danseur to love. Life offers many chances, not just one. Come back. Her note put a wistful smile on my face. She even spelled love, L-U-V. What is it that makes you smile like that? asked Paul, laying aside the medical journal that must have held only a part of his interest. Awkwardly, I leaned forward to hand the note to him. He read it, then held out his arms, inviting me to come and cuddle on his lap and in his arms. Eagerly, I accepted his invitation. I was hungry for affection. Life seemed to me nothing without a man. "'You could go on with your career,' he said softly, "'though I pray to God you won't go back to New York and leave me again. "'Once upon a time,' I began, "'there was a beautiful set of blonde parents "'who gave life to four children who should never have been, "'and they adored them beyond reason. "'Then one day the father was killed.' and the mother changed and forgot all about the love, affection, and attention those four children so desperately needed. So now that another beautiful husband is dead, I will not have my child feel neglected or fatherless or unwanted and unnecessary. When my child cries, I'll be there. I'll be there always to make my child feel secure and very loved, and I'll read to him and sing to him, and he'll never feel left out or betrayed as Chris felt betrayed by the one he loved most. He? You sound as if you know. His iridescent eyes looked sad. And are you going to be both mother and father to this child? Are you going to close the gates to any man who might want to share your life? Catherine, I hope you are not going to be one of those women who lets herself go sour because life doesn't always fulfill her wishes. I leaned my head backward to stare into his eyes. You don't still love me, do you? Don't I? That's no answer. I didn't think I needed to answer. I thought you could tell. I thought, too, from the way you look at me, that you would turn to me again. I love you, Catherine. Since the day you first came up my veranda steps, I've loved you. I love the way you talk, the way you smile, the way you walk. That is, before you became pregnant and started leaning backward and holding to your back. Does it hurt that much? Oh, I said in disgust, why did you have to stop saying all those sweet words to ask if my back hurts? Of course it bothers me. I'm not used to carrying an extra 19 pounds in front. Go on with what you were saying before you remembered you're a doctor. He slowly lowered his lips to brush mine, just lightly before passion came and he pressed them hard with his own. My arms found their way around his neck and ardently I returned, kiss for kiss. The front door opened and then banged shut. I pulled quickly away from Paul and tried to stand up before Chris came into the room, but I wasn't quick enough. He strode in, his overcoat covering his white intern suit. He carried a bag with a quart of pistachio ice cream that I had expressed a desire for at dinner. "'I thought you were on duty tonight,' I said, too quickly to hide my distress and surprise. He thrust the ice cream into my hands and looked at me coldly. "'I am on duty, but it's a dull night, so I thought I could take a few minutes off to drive and get you the dessert you seem to want so much.' He flicked his glance to Paul. "'I'm sorry I arrived at the wrong time. Go on with what you were doing.' He spun on his heel and left the room, then slammed the front door a second time. Kathy, said Paul, who got up to take the ice cream from me. We have to do something about Chris. What he wants can never be. 
I've tried to talk to him about it, but he won't listen. He closes his ears and walks away. You must make him understand that he's ruining his life by refusing to let any other girl into his heart. He went on into the kitchen, coming back in a few minutes with two sherbet dishes of the green ice cream I didn't want now. He was right. Something did have to be done about Chris, but what? I couldn't hurt him. I couldn't hurt Paul. I was like a battlefield, wanting both sides to win. Catherine, said Paul softly, as if he'd been watching my reaction. You don't owe me if you don't love me. Cut Chris off. Make it clear that he has to let go and find someone else. Anyone else but you. I find it so difficult to tell him that, I said in a low voice, ashamed to admit I didn't want Chris to find anyone else. I wanted him with me, always. Just the nearness of him, the confidence he gave me, nothing else. I was trying to balance my time between Chris and Paul, to give each of them enough, but not too much. I watched the jealousy between them grow and felt it was none of my fault, only Mama's, as everything wrong in my life was her fault. It was a cold February night when I felt my first contraction. I gasped from the sharp pain. I had known it would hurt, but not so much. I glanced at the clock. Two in the morning of St. Valentine's Day. Oh, how marvellous! My baby would be born on what would have been our sixth wedding anniversary. Julian, I cried out as if he could hear me, you are about to become a father. I got up and dressed as speedily as I could before I crossed the hall to rap on Paul's door. He mumbled something in way of a question. Paul, I called. I think I just had my first contraction. Thank God, he cried from the other side, instantly wide awake. Are you all set to go? Of course. I've been ready for a month. I'll call your doctor, then alert Chris. You sit down and take it easy. Would it be all right if I came in? He swung open the door, wearing only his trousers. His chest was bare. You're the calmest mother-to-be I've ever seen, he said as he helped me sit. He raced next to swipe at his face with an electric razor, then he was running to put on a shirt and tie. Had any more contractions? It was on the tip of my tongue to say no when another seized me. I doubled over. Fifteen minutes since the last, I gasped. He looked pale as he pulled on his jacket, then came to help me up. Okay, I'll put you in the car first, then go for your suitcase. Keep calm, don't worry. This baby will have three doctors doing their very best. To get in each other's way, I concluded. To see you have the best medical attention possible, he corrected. Then he bellowed toward the kitchen. Henny, I'm taking Catherine to the hospital. Tell Carrie when she wakes up. Then call Madame Marisha and put on that tape we made for her. We'd thought of everything. When Paul opened the front door after he'd backed his car out, I heard behind me the tape playing for Madame Marisha, my own voice speaking, Madame, I taped weeks ago, your grandchild is on the way. It seemed forever before the hospital loomed up ahead. Under a protective canopy at the emergency entrance, a solitary intern paced restlessly back and forth. Chris, who said, Thank God you're here. I was picturing all sorts of calamities. Even as he assisted me out, while someone else rushed up with a wheelchair, and without any of the preliminaries other patients had to endure, I was snug in bed in no time at all, and gasping from another contraction. Three hours later my son was born. Chris and Paul were there, both of them with tears in their eyes, but it was Chris who picked up my son, still with the cord attached, messy and bloody. He put him upon my belly and held him there while another doctor did what he had to. Kathy, can you see him? He's beautiful, I breathed in awe seeing all the dark, curling hair, the perfect little red body. With a fierce anger so like his father's, he waved his tiny fists and flailed his thin legs, screaming at all the indignities inflicted upon him, and all the light that came so suddenly to shine in his eyes and put him center stage, so to speak. His name is Julian Janice Marquette, but I'm going to call him Jory. Both Chris and Paul heard my thin whisper, 
I was so tired, so sleepy. Why would you call him Jory? asked Paul. But it wasn't me who had the strength to answer. It was Chris who understood my reasoning. If he had been blonde, she would have named him Corey. But the J will stand for Julian and the rest for Corey. Our eyes met and I smiled. How wonderful to be understood and never have to explain. Part 4 Chapter 25 My Sweet Small Prince If ever a child was born into a palace of adoring worshippers, it was my jewelry, with his blue-black curls, his pale, creamy skin, and his dark, dark blue eyes. He was Julian all over, and to him I could give the lavish affection I'd been unable to give his father. From the very first, Jory seemed to know I was his mother. He seemed to know my voice, my touch, even the sound of my footsteps. Yet he had almost as great a love for Carrie, who ran home every night straight from Paul's office to gather him in her arms and play with him for hours. "'We should find our own place,' said Chris, who wanted to establish himself firmly as Jory's father. In Paul's home this wasn't possible. I didn't know what to say to that. I loved Paul's big house and being with him and Henny. I wanted Jory to have the garden paths where I could push him in his carriage and he'd be surrounded by beauty. And in no way could Chris and I give him as much. Chris didn't know about my sky-high debts. Upstairs Paul had made a nursery completely refurbished with crib, playpen, bassinet, and dozens of soft, plushy, stuffed animals a baby could enjoy without harming himself. There were times when both Paul and Chris would rush home with the same toy. They'd look at each other and both would force a smile to hide the embarrassment. Then I had to rush forward and exclaim, Two men with the same idea! And one would have to be taken back, but never, never did I let either one know whose gift it was that I returned. Carrie graduated from high school the June she was seventeen. She didn't want college. She was very much contented to be Paul's private secretary. Her small fingers could fly over the typewriter keyboard. She took dictation with remarkable speed and accuracy. But still she kept wishing for someone to love her despite her small size. To see her unhappy made me furious with my mother again. I began to dwell on what I would do when I had my chance. Now I was free, no husband to hold me back, make her pay as Carrie was paying. Each day she saw Paul and Chris battling for my attention, each desiring me, each beginning to look at the other with enmity. I had to settle something that should have been settled a long time ago. If only Julian hadn't put himself in the way, I would now be Paul's wife and Jory would be Paul's son. And yet, and yet, I loved Jory for who he was and on second thought I was glad I'd had Julian for a while. I was no longer a sweet, innocent virgin. Two men had taught me well. I would have the knowledge to hold my own when it came time to steal my mother's husband away from her. I'd be like she'd been with Daddy. I'd cast Bart Winslow's shy glances, meaningful long, long looks. I'd reach to caress his cheek. And my biggest asset of all was I looked like her, but I was years younger. How could he resist?' I'd put on a few pounds to make myself curvier, like her. Christmas came, and Jory, less than a year old, sat amidst his presence, wide-eyed and bewildered, not knowing what to do or which toy to pick up first. Snap, 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 went the click of three cameras. But Paul had the movie camera, not Chris, Carrie, or I. Lullaby and good night, sang Carrie softly to my son, rocking him to sleep on Christmas night. May heaven's sweet charms hold you safe in its arms. I couldn't help but cry to see her there, like a child herself, but so longing to have a child of her own. Chris came up behind me and put his arms around my waist as I leaned back against him. I should run for a camera, he whispered. They look so sweet together, but I don't want to break the spell. Carrie is so much like you, Kathy, except in size. One little word, except. One little word that kept Carrie from ever feeling really happy. Footsteps sounded on the stairs. 
Quickly I jerked from Chris's arms and went in to tuck my small son into his crib. I sensed Paul in the doorway now that Chris had gone on to his room. "'Kathy,' whispered Carrie so Jory wouldn't awaken, "'do you think I'll ever have a baby?' "'Yes, of course you will.' "'I don't think I will,' she said, and then ambled away, leaving me to stare after her. Paul came into the nursery, kissed Jory goodnight, then turned as if to take me in his arms. "'No,' I said in a small voice, "'not while Chris is in the house.' He nodded stiffly, then said good night, and I went to lie awake until almost dawn, wondering how I could solve the dilemma I was in. Jory seemed quite happy with his situation. He wasn't spoiled. He didn't whine and cry or make unnecessary demands. He just accepted. He could sit for minutes, staring from one to the other of us, as if sizing us up and our relationship to him. He had the patience of Chris, the quiet sweetness of Corey and only occasionally the brashness of his father and his mother. But nothing at all about Jory reminded me of Carrie. He smiled so much more than she. Nevertheless, when Carrie strolled through Paul's gardens with Jory in her arms, she pointed out the differences between this tree and that, incessantly explaining. She forced Jory to imitate speech sooner than he would have done otherwise. "'Regard this oak leaf,' said Carrie one day, after Jory had learned to walk and spring breezes stirred the air. "'Each tree leaf has its own shape, texture, and smell. All flowers open up easily for a bee to enter, except the rose. But daisies don't smell as pretty as roses, so the bees fly right on by and head for the roses that are so stingy with their nectar, and hold their heads high on tall stems.' She pointed to a rose, then glanced at me. Next, she was showing Jory the daisies and the pansies. Now, if I were a bee, you could bet I'd go straight for the violets and pansies, too, even though they don't stand as tall. She lifted her eyes to meet mine and said in a strange, tight, small voice, You are like a rose, Kathy. All the bees come to you, and they don't even see me down so low. Please don't get married again before I have my chance. Please don't be around if ever some man looks my way. Don't you smile at him, please? Oh, how fast the years go when you have a baby to fill all the hours. All of us took snapshots like crazy. Jory's first smile, his first tooth, his first crawl from me to Chris and then over to Paul and to Carrie. Paul began his courtship that was to last two years. The same two years Chris interned in the Claremont Hospital. They couldn't hurt each other when each loved and respected the other. They couldn't even speak of the barrier between them, except through me. "'It's this town,' said Chris. "'I think Carrie would fare better in another city, all of us together.' It was twilight in the gardens, our favourite time there. Paul was off making his rounds in three hospitals, and Carrie was entertaining Jory before she put him to bed. Henny rattled pots and pans to let us know she was still up and still busy. Chris had completed his two years of internship and had started on his residency, which would take another three years. When he told me he was considering another hospital, far more famous, to further his training, I felt a deep shock. He was leaving me. "'I'm sorry, Kathy. The Mayo Clinic has accepted me, and that's an honour.' I'll only be there nine months and then back here to complete my training. Why don't you and Jory come with me? His eyes were very bright and lambent. Carrie can stay to keep Paul company. Chris, you know I can't do that. You are going to stay on here after I'm gone? He asked bitterly. If Julian's insurance company would pay off, I could afford a house of my own and start my own dance school. But they keep insisting his death was suicide. I know that policy has a two-year suicide clause, and we paid on it since the day we married, so it was not in effect when he died, yet they won't pay. What you need is a good attorney. My heart jumped. Yes, yes, I do. Chris, go on to the Mayo Clinic without me. I'll make out fine, and I swear not to marry anyone until you are back and give your approval. Worry about finding someone yourself. After all, I'm not the only woman who resembles our mother. He flared. 
Why the hell do you put it like that? It's you, not her. It's everything about you that's not like her that makes me need and want you so. Chris, I want a man I can sleep with who will hold me when I feel afraid and kiss me and make me believe I am not evil or unworthy. My voice broke as tears came. I wanted to show Mama what I could do and be the best prima ballerina, but now that Julian's gone, all I want to do is cry when I hear ballet music. I miss him so, Chris. I put my head on his chest and sobbed. I could have been nicer to him, then he wouldn't have struck out in anger. He needed me and I failed him. You don't need me. You're stronger than he was. Paul doesn't really need me either or he would insist on marrying me right away. We could live together and... and... And here he faltered as his face turned red. I finished for him. No, can't you see? It just wouldn't work. No, I guess it wouldn't work for you, he said stiffly. But I'm a fool. I've always been a fool, wanting the impossible. I'm even fool enough to want us locked up again the way we were, with me the only male available to you. You don't mean that. He seized me in his arms. Don't I? God help me, but I do mean it. You belonged to me then, and in its own peculiar way our life together made me better than I would have been. And you made me want you, Kathy. You could have made me hate you. Instead, you made me love you. I shook my head, denying this. I'd only done what came naturally from watching my mother with men. I stared at him, trembling as he released me. I stumbled as I turned to run toward the house. Before me, Paul loomed up. Startled, I faltered guiltily and stared at him as he turned abruptly and strode in the opposite direction. Oh, he'd been watching and listening. I pivoted about, then raced back to where Chris had his head resting against the trunk of the oldest oak. See what you've done, I cried out. Forget me, Chris. I'm not the one and only woman alive. He appeared blind as he turned his head, and he said, You are for me the only woman alive. October came, the time for Chris's departure. To see him pack, to know he was going say goodbye as if I didn't care when he came back made me deathly ill while I smiled. I cried in the rose arbor. It would be easier now. I wouldn't have to keep putting Paul off so Chris wouldn't be hurt. No longer would I have to weigh each smile and balance it off against what I'd given the other. Now I had a clear straight path to Paul, but something got in my eyes the vision of my mother as she stepped off the plane with her husband on the step behind her. She was coming back to Green Glenna. I clipped out the news photo and the caption and put that in my scrapbook. Perhaps if she'd stayed away I would have married Paul then and there. As it was, I did something entirely unplanned. Madame Marisha was getting along and needed an assistant, so I went to convince her I should be the one to keep her school running if ever, well, you could never tell. I don't intend to die, she snapped. Then begrudgingly she nodded, her ebony eyes suspicious. Yes, I suppose you would think of me as old, though I never do. But don't you try and take over and try to run me. I am still the boss here and will be until I am in my grave. By the time November rolled around, I realized working with Madame M was impossible, she had fixed ideas about everything, while I had a few ideas of my own. But I needed money. I needed a place of my own. I wasn't ready to marry Paul, and if I stayed there, that's just what would happen. I had spent enough years plotting and planning. It was time to make my move. The first pawn to play would be Mr. Attorney at Law. It wouldn't work if I stayed with Paul, and though he objected, saying it was an unnecessary expense... I explained I had to have a chance to be my own person and in my own home to find out what I really wanted. He gave me a puzzled look, then a more shrewd one. All right, Catherine, do what you must. You will, anyway. It's only because Chris insisted that I not marry again until Carrie had her chance, and Chris objects to my staying here with you when he isn't here. My ending was lame and oh such a lie. I understand, he said with a wry smile. 
Since the day Julian died, it has been very clear that I am in competition with your brother for your affection. I've tried to talk to him about it, but he won't let me. I tried to talk to you about it, and you won't let me. So go live in your own home and be your own person and find your own self. And when you feel grown up enough to act adult, come back to me. Chapter 26 Opening Gambit As soon as I was installed in a small rented cottage halfway between Claremont and Green Glenna, I sat down to draft a blackmail letter to my mother. I was deeply in debt with one child, but I had Carrie, too. The enormous bills Julian had run up in New York stores were still unpaid. There was also his hospital bill, his funeral bill, plus my own hospital bills made when Jory was born. Credit cards just didn't solve everything. Not for one moment was I going to accept more from Paul. He'd done enough. I needed to prove I was better than Mama, more able, smarter. And what did I do but write her a letter, as she'd written to her mother after Daddy died? Why not ask for just one paltry million? Why not? She owed us. It was ours, too. With that money I could pay off all the debts I owed, pay back Paul, and do something to make Carrie happier. And if I felt some shame to do the same thing she'd done, in a way, I rationalized it away by thinking it was her own fault. She'd asked for it. Jory was not going to live his life in need when she had so much. Finally, after many futile attempts, I came up with what I believed the perfect letter of extortion. Dear Mrs. Winslow, Once upon a Gladstone, Pennsylvania time, there lived a man and wife who had four children everyone referred to as the Dresden Dolls. Now one of those dolls lies in a lonely grave, and another of those dolls fails to grow to the height that should have been hers if she'd have been given sunlight and fresh air and the love that a mother owed her when she needed it most. Now the ballerina doll has a small son of her own and not much money. I know, Mrs. Winston, you don't have much compassion for children who might cast a shadow over your sunny days, so I will come directly to the point. The ballerina doll demands payment of one million dollars if you are to keep any of your millions or billions. You may send that amount to the post office box I name, and be assured, Mrs. Winslow, that if you fail to do so, the ears of Mr. Bartholomew Winslow, attorney at law, will be filled with horror tales I'm sure you'd rather he not hear. Cordially yours, the ballerina doll, Catherine Dollenganger Marquette. Each day I waited for a check to come in the mail. Each day I was disappointed. I wrote another letter, then another, and another. Each day for seven days I mailed off a letter to her with a fierce anger growing in my heart. What was one measly million to her who had so many? I wasn't asking for too much. Part of that money belonged to us anyway. Then, after fruitless months of waiting, while Christmas and the New Year came and went, I decided I'd waited long enough. She was going to ignore me. I looked up a number in the Green Glenner telephone book, and in no time at all I had an appointment to see Bartholomew Winslow, attorney at law. It was February, and Jory was three. He was to spend the afternoon with Henny and Carrie, as I, dressed in my very best, with my hair becomingly styled, sauntered into the posh office to gaze upon my mother's husband. At last I was looking at him up close, and this time he had his eyes open. Slowly he rose to his feet, wearing a bemused expression, as if he'd seen me before and couldn't quite remember where. I thought back to the night I'd stolen to Mama's grand suite of rooms in Foxworth Hall, and found Bart Winslow asleep in the chair. He'd had a big dark moustache then, and I had dared to kiss him while he dozed, believing as I did that he was fully asleep, and he hadn't been. He'd seen me and thought me part of his dream. Because of one stolen kiss that Chris was to hear about later, the repercussions had led Chris and I down a path we'd determined never to follow. Now we were paying the price, and it was her fault that Chris was now living apart from me, trying to deny what she'd started. I could not accept Paul as my husband until I had made her pay, and not just in money. He smiled at me then, my mother's ruggedly handsome husband, 
and I saw for the first time the dazzling charisma of him. A light of recognition came into his dark brown eyes. As I live and breathe, if it isn't Miss Catherine Dahl, the lovely ballerina who takes my breath away even before she dances. I'm enchanted you have need of a lawyer, and you chose me, though I cannot possibly imagine why you are here. Here. You've seen me dance, I asked, stunned to hear he had. If he had seen me, then Mama must have too. Oh, and I never knew, never knew. I glowed, I dimmed, saddened, became confused. Somewhere deep within me, despite all the hate on top, I still felt some of the love I'd had for her when I was young and trusting. My wife is a ballet buff, he went on. Actually, I didn't care much for it when she first started dragging me to every one of your performances. But soon I learned to enjoy it, especially when you and your husband were featured in the lead roles. In fact, my wife seemed to have no interest in ballet at all unless you and your husband were featured. I used to fear she had a crush on your husband. He looks a little like me. He took my hand and lifted it to his lips, flashing his eyes upward and smiling with the easy charm of a man who knew what he was, a ladies' man used to putting notches on his belt. You are even more beautiful off stage than on. But what are you doing in this part of the country? I live here. He pulled out a chair for me, sat me down so close he could watch my legs when I crossed them. He perched on the edge of his desk to offer me a cigarette, which I refused. He lit one for himself, then asked, You're on vacation, visiting your husband's mother? I realized he didn't know about Julian. Mr. Winslow, my husband died from injuries sustained in an auto accident more than three years ago. Didn't you hear about it? He appeared shocked and a bit embarrassed. No, I didn't hear. I'm very sorry. Please accept my belated condolences. He sighed and ground out his half-smoked cigarette. The two of you were sensational on stage. It's a terrible pity. I've seen my wife cry. She was so impressed. Yeah, I'll bet she was impressed. I shrugged off more questions and came directly to the object of my visit by handing him Julian's insurance policy. He took out this policy shortly after we were married, and now they won't pay because they think he cut the intravenous tube that was feeding him. But as you can see, after two years, the suicide clause is no longer in effect. He sat down to read it carefully and then looked up at me again. I'll see what I can do. Are you in immediate need of this money? Who isn't in need of money, Mr. Winslow, unless they are millionaires? I smiled and tilted my head in the manner of my mother. I have hundreds of bills, and I have a small son to support. He asked the age of my son. I told him. He appeared puzzled and confounded in more ways than one as I looked at him with sleepy, half-closed eyes, my head tilted backward and slightly to one side in a mannerism that was my mother's way of looking at a man. I was only fifteen when I'd kissed him. He was far more handsome now. His mature face was long and lean, his bones too prominent, but in a very virile, masculine way he was strikingly good-looking. Something about him suggested an exaggerated sensuality. And no wonder my mother hadn't sent a check. Probably all my blackmail letters were still following her from place to place. Bart Winslow asked a dozen or more questions, then he said he'd see what he could do. I'm a pretty good lawyer once my wife allows me to stay home and get my hand into a practice. Your wife is very rich, isn't she? This appeared to annoy him. I suppose you could say she is, he answered stiffly, letting me know he didn't like discussing the subject. I stood to leave. I'll bet your rich wife leads you around like a pet poodle on a jeweled leash, Mr. Winslow. That's the way rich women are. They don't know the least thing about working for a living. And I wonder if you do. Well, by God, he said, jumping off the desk and standing with feet wide apart. Why did you come if you feel that way? Go to another attorney, Miss Dow. I don't want a client who insults me and has no regard for my abilities. No, Mr. Winslow, I want you. I want you to prove you know your business as you claim to. Maybe, in a way, you can then prove something to yourself as well, 
that you aren't, after all, just a rich woman's bought little plaything. You have the face of an angel, Miss Dow, but a bitch's tongue. I'll see your husband's insurance firm pays off. I'll petition them to appear in court and threaten to sue. Ten to one, they'll settle within ten days. Good, I said. Let me know, for as soon as I have the money, I'm moving. Where? he asked, striding forward to take hold of my arm. I laughed looking up into his face and using the ways a woman had to make a man interested. i let you know where I go, in case you want to keep in touch. In ten days, true to his word, Bartholomew Winslow came by the dance school to hand me the check for one hundred thousand dollars. Your fee? I asked, waving off the girls and boys who came running to surround me. I was wearing a tight practice outfit, and he was all eyes. A dinner at eight next Tuesday night. Wear blue to match your eyes and we'll discuss the fee then, he said, then turned to leave, not even waiting for my answer. When he was gone, I turned around and looked at the children doing their warm-up positions, and somewhere above I hovered looking down and feeling scorn for the pitiful thing I was that innocence should admire me so much. I felt sad for them, for me. "'Who was that man who came to give you cheque?' "'Madame Marisha asked me when class was over. "'An attorney I hired to force Julian's insurance company to pay off, "'and they did. "'Ah,' she said, falling into her old swivel desk chair, "'now you have money and can pay off bills. "'I suppose you will quit working for me and go off somewhere, yeah? "'I'm not sure just what I plan to do yet.' But you must admit, madame, you and I don't get along very well, do we? You have too many ideas I don't like. You think you know more than me. You think now that you work here a few months, you can go away and start new school of your own. She smiled evilly to see my start of surprise, revealing the truth she only guessed at. So, you think me stupid, too. You look all your life before you find another as smart as me. I read your mind, Catherine. You don't like me. Never have, never will. Yet, you come to work for me to learn the business. Right again? I don't care. Dancing schools come and dancing schools go. But the Rosenkopf School of Ballet go on forever. Once I thought I'd leave it to Julian. But he's dead. Then I thought when I die I'd leave it to you. But I won't if you take your son away so I can't teach him. Madame, that is your choice, but I am taking Jory away. Why? You think you can teach him as well as I can? I don't know for certain, but I think I can. My son may not choose to be a dancer, I continued, ignoring her hard, stony eyes. If he does decide one day, I think I will make an able teacher, as good as any. If he choose to dance words like cannon shot. What other choice does Julian's son have but to dance? It is in his bones, in his brain, and most of all in his blood and in his heart. He dances or he dies. I got up to leave. It was in my heart to be kind to her, to let her share in Jory's life, but the meanness in her hard eyes changed my mind. She would take my son and make of him what she'd made of Julian, someone who could never find fulfillment because life offered to him but one choice. I didn't expect to say this today, madame, but you force me. You made Julian believe if he couldn't dance, then life held nothing. He would have recovered from that broken neck and his internal injuries, except you said he would never dance again and he overheard you. He wasn't sleeping. So he chose to die. The very fact that he could move the arm that wasn't strapped down enough to steal the scissors from that nurse's pocket, proved he was already recovering, but all he could see was a bleak desert where the ballet didn't exist. Well, madame, you are not doing that to my son. My son will have the chance to choose for himself what kind of life he wants, and I hope to God it is not the ballet. You fool, she spat at me, jumping up to pace back and forth in front of her old beat-up desk. There is nothing better than adulation from your fans, the sound of thundering applause, the feel of roses in your arms. And soon enough you will find that out for yourself. 
You think to take my husband's grandson away and hide him from the stage. Jury will dance, and before I die I will live to see him on stage, doing what he must, or he too will die. You want to play mummy, she sneered, curling her lips scornfully, and wifey to that big handsome doctor too, perhaps, and make another child for him, yeah? Well, to hell with you, Catherine, if that is all you want out of life. She broke then, and sobs came from deep down in her depths to make her voice, when she spoke again, harsh and husky, when before it had been high and shrill. Yes, go on. Marry that big doctor you've had a yen for since you came starry-eyed and fresh-faced as a kid to me, and ruin his life too. Ruin his life too, I repeated dully. She spun about. You got something eating at you, Catherine, something gnawing at your guts, something so bitter it simmers in your eyes and grits your teeth together. I know your kind. You ruin everyone who touches your life, and God help the next man who loves you as much as my son did. Unexpectedly, some enigmatic, invisible cloak dropped down to wrap me in my mother's cool, detached poise. Never before had I felt so untouchable. Thank you for enlightening me, madame. Goodbye and good luck. You won't be seeing me again or Jory. I turned and left. Left for good. Tuesday night, Bart Winslow showed up at my cottage door. He was dressed in his best, and I was wearing blue. He smiled, pleased I'd obeyed. He took me to a Chinese restaurant where we ate with chopsticks and everything was black or red. "'You are the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, with the exception of my wife,' he said, while I read my fortune cookie slip. "'Beware of impulsive actions.' "'Most men don't mention their wives when they take another woman out,' he interrupted. "'I am not an ordinary man. I'm just letting you know you are not the most beautiful woman I know.' I smiled at him sweetly, closely watching his eyes. I saw I irritated him, charmed him, but most of all intrigued him. And when we danced, I also learned I excited him. What is beauty without brains, I asked, my lips brushing his ear as I stood on tiptoes. What is beauty that is growing old and overweight and no challenge at all? You are the damnedest female I've ever known, his dark eyes flashed. How dare you imply my wife is stupid, old and fat. She looks very young for her age. So do you, I said with a small mocking laugh. His face reddened. But don't worry, Mr. Attorney, I'm not competing with her. I don't want a pet poodle. Lady, he said coldly, you won't have one, not in me. I'm leaving soon to set up my offices in Virginia. My wife's mother isn't well and needs some attendance. As soon as you've settled your account with me, you can say goodbye to a man who obviously brings out the worst in you. You haven't mentioned your fee. I haven't decided yet. Now I knew where I was going, back to Virginia to live somewhere near Foxworth Hall. Now I could begin the real revenge. But Kathy, wailed Carrie tearfully, very upset because we were leaving Paul and Henny, I don't want to leave. I love Dr. Paul and Henny. You go anywhere you want to, but leave me here. Can't you see Dr. Paul doesn't want us to go? Don't you care when you hurt him? You're always hurting him. I don't want to. I care very much about Dr. Paul, Carrie, and I don't want to hurt him. However, there are certain things I must do, and I must do now. And Carrie, you belong with me and Jory. Paul needs his chance to find a wife without so many dependents. Don't you see we are an encumbrance to him? She backed off and glared at me. Kathy, he wants you for his wife. He hasn't said so in a long, long time. That's because you got your mind set on going and doing something else. He told me he wants you to have what you want. He loves you too much. If I were him, I'd make you stay and wouldn't care what you wanted. She sobbed then and ran from me to slam her bedroom door. I went to Paul and told him where I was going and why. 
His happy expression turned sad, and then his eyes went vague. Yes, I suspected all along you would feel it necessary to go back there and confront your mother face to face. I've seen you making your plans, and I hoped you'd ask me to go with you. It's something I have to do myself, I said, holding to both his hands now. Understand, please understand, I still love you and always will. I understand, he said simply. I wish you luck, my Catherine. I wish you happiness. I wish all your days are bright and sunny and you get what you want, whether or not I am included in your plans. When you need me, if you ever need me, I'll be here, waiting to do what I can. Every minute I'll be loving you and missing you. Just remember, when you want me, I'll be there. I didn't deserve him. He was much too fine for the likes of me. I didn't want Chris or Carrie to know what part of Virginia I was headed for. Chris wrote to me once or twice a week, and I responded letter for letter, but not one word did I tell him. He'd find out when he saw the change of address. The month was May, and the day after Carrie's twentieth birthday party, celebrated without Chris there, Carrie, Jory, and I set off in my car, backing out of Paul's driveway where we had come to say goodbye. Paul waved, and when I looked in the rear-view mirror, I saw him reach in his breast pocket for his handkerchief. He touched the tears in the corners of his eyes, even as he kept on waving. Henny stared after us. I thought I saw written in her expressive brown eyes, Fool, 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 to go away and leave, good man. Nothing proved more what a fool I was than the sunny day I set out for the mountains of Virginia with my small sister and son in the front seat next to me. But I had to do it, compelled by my own nature to seek the revenge in the place of our incarceration. Chapter 27 The Siren Call of the Mountains At the last moment I decided I couldn't risk seeing Bart Winslow even long enough to pay his fee, so I dropped a cheque for $200 in a mailbox and considered that enough, whether or not it was. With Carrie beside me and Jory on her lap, I headed straight for the Blue Ridge Mountains. Carrie was very excited now that we were on our way, her big blue eyes wide as she commented on everything we passed. Oh, I love to travel, she said happily. When Jory grew sleepy, she carefully made a bed for him on the back seat and sat with him to be sure he didn't roll off and fall to the floor. He's so beautiful, Kathy. I am going to have at least six children, or maybe even more. I want half to look just like Jory, and half like you and Chris, and two or three like Paul. I love you, Carrie, and I pity you, too. You're planning on a dozen children, not just six. Don't worry, she said, settling back to take a nap herself. Nobody is going to want me, so I won't ever have any children but yours to love. That's not true. I've got the feeling, once we are in our new home, Miss Carrie Dollenganger Sheffield is going to have a love of her own. I'll even bet you five dollars. Is it a bet? She smiled, but she refused to take on the bet. As I drove on northwest and the night began to descend, Carrie grew very quiet. She stared out the windows and then back at me, and her large blue eyes held a look of fear. Kathy, are we going back there? No, not exactly. That's all I'd say until we'd found a hotel and settled in for the night. The first thing in the morning, a real estate woman I'd contacted in advance came to drive us in her car to look over the properties for sale. She was a large, mannish woman and all business. What you need is something compact, utilitarian, and not too expensive. In this neighborhood, all the houses run into big money. But there are a few small houses that the rich people used to use for guest homes, or they house their servants in some. There's one that's very pretty with a nice flower garden. She showed us that five-room cottage first, and immediately I was won over. I think Carrie was, too, but I had warned her to show no signs of approval. 
I picked at small details to lead the agent astray. The chimney looks like it won't work. It's a fine chimney, a good draft. The furnace, does it use oil or gas? Natural gas was installed five years ago, and the bath has been remodeled. The kitchen, too. A couple used to live here who worked for the Foxworths on the hill, but they sold out and went down to Florida. But you can tell they loved this house. Of course they had. Only a house that had been very beloved would have all the nice little details that made it exceptional. I bought it and signed all the papers without a lawyer, though I'd read up on the subject and insisted on having the deed checked. "'We'll have a wall oven put in with a glass door,' I said to Carrie, who loved to cook. "'Thank God, for I'd hardly have the time. "'And we'll repaint the whole interior of the house ourselves and save the money.' "'Already I was finding out that one hundred thousand, "'after paying all the accounts I had to settle "'and putting the down payment on the cottage, was not going to last long. "'But I hadn't gone into this venture blindfolded.' While Carrie stayed with Jory in a motel, I visited the ballet instructor who was selling her school and retiring. She was blonde and very small and nearing seventy. She seemed pleased to see me as we shook hands and settled on the amount she wanted. I've seen you and your husband dance, and really, Miss Dahl, though I'm delighted you want my school, it's a shame you are retiring at such an early age. I couldn't have given up performing at twenty-seven, never. She wasn't me. She didn't have my past or my kind of childhood. When she saw my determination to go through with the deal, she gave me the list of her students. Most of these children belong to the wealthy people who live around here, and I don't think any of them seriously intend to become professional dancers. They come to please their parents, who like to see them looking pretty in little tutus during the recitals. I have failed to turn out one gifted performer. All three bedrooms in our cottage were very small, but the living room was L-shaped and of reasonable proportions, with a fireplace, sided by bookcases. The short part of the L could be used as a dining room. Carrie and I set to work with paint brushes, and in one week we had painted every room a soft green. With the white woodwork it looked delicious. The space opened up and everything seemed larger. Carrie, of course, would have to have red and purple accessories for her room. In three weeks we had both settled into a new routine, with me teaching the ballet school located over the local pharmacy, and Carrie doing the housework and most of the cooking while she looked out for jewellery. As often as possible, I took Jory with me to class, not only to relieve Carrie of the responsibility, but also to have him near me. I was remembering Madame Mariche's talk of letting him look and listen and get the feel of the dance. I sat one Saturday morning in early June, staring out the windows at the blue misted mountains that never changed. The Foxworth mansion was still the same, I could have turned back the clock to 1957 and on this night taken Jory and Carrie by the hand and followed those meandering trails from the train depot. It would have been the same as when Mama led her four children up to their prison of hope and despair, then left them to be tortured, whipped and starved. I went over and over everything that had happened. The wooden key we'd made to escape our prison room, the money we'd stolen from our mother's grand bedroom, that night when we found a large book of sexual pleasures in the nightstand drawer. Maybe if we'd never seen that book, maybe then things would have turned out differently. "'What are you thinking of?' asked Carrie. "'Are you thinking we should go back to visit Dr. Paul and Henny? "'I hope that's what you're thinking.' "'Really, Carrie, you know I can't do that. "'It's recital time, and the little girls and boys in my class will be rehearsing every day.' It's the recitals the parents pay to see. Without them, they have nothing to boast of to their friends. But maybe we could ask Paul and Henny to visit us. Carrie pouted, and then for some reason brightened. You know, Kathy, the day the man came to put in the new oven, he was young and good-looking, and when he saw me with Jory, he asked if that was my son. That made me giggle, and he smiled too. His name was... Theodore Alexander Rockingham, but he asked me to call him Alex. 
Here she paused and looked at me fearfully, with hope trembling her all over. Kathy, he asked me for a date. Did you accept? No. Why not? I don't know him well enough. He said he's going to college and works part-time doing electrical work to help pay his tuition. He says he's going to be an electrical engineer, or maybe a minister. He hasn't decided yet which one. She gave me a small smile of both pride and embarrassment. Kathy, he didn't seem to notice how little I am. The way she said that made me smile too. Carrie, you're blushing. You tell me one moment you don't know this fellow very well, and then you come up with all sorts of pertinent facts. Let's invite him to dinner. Then I can find out if he's good enough for my sister. But, but, she stammered, her small face flushed red. Alex asked me to go home with him to Maryland for a weekend. He told his parents about me. But, Kathy, I'm not ready to meet his parents. Her blue eyes were full of panic. That's when I realized that Carrie must have seen this young man many, many times while I was teaching my ballet classes. Look, darling, invite Alex here to dinner and let him fly home alone. I think I should know him better before you go off with him alone. She gave me the strangest long look, then lowered her eyes to the floor. Will you be here if he comes to dinner? Why, of course I will. Only then did it dawn on me. Oh, God. I drew her into my arms. Look, sweetheart, I'll ask Paul to come up this weekend, so when Alex sees I go for older men, he won't even glance my way. Besides, you saw him first, and he saw you first. He won't want an older woman with a child. Happily, she threw her thin arms about my neck. Kathy, I love you, and Alex can fix toasters, steam irons... Alex can fix anything. One week later, Alex and Paul were at our dinner table. Alex was a nice-looking young man of 23 who complimented my cooking. I was quick to point out that Carrie had prepared most of the meal. No, she denied modestly. Kathy did most of it. I only stuffed the chicken, made the dressing, mashed the potatoes, made the hot rolls and the lemon meringue pie. Kathy did the rest. Suddenly I felt I'd done nothing but set the table. Paul winked to show he understood. When Alex took Carrie to the movies, and Jory was snug in bed with his favourite stuffed toys, Paul and I settled down before the fire like an old married couple. "'Have you seen your mother yet?' he asked. "'They're here, my mother and her husband,' I said quietly, "'staying in Foxworth Hall.' The local newspaper is full of their comings and goings. It seems my dear stone-eyed grandmother has suffered a slight stroke, so the Bartholomew Winslows will now make their home with her, that is, until she is dead. Paul didn't say anything for the longest time. We sat before the fire and watched the red coals burn down to grey ashes. I like what you've done with this house, he said finally. It's very cosy. He got up then and came to sit close by my side on the sofa. Tenderly, he drew me into his arms. He just held me with our eyes locked. "'Where do I fit in?' he whispered. "'Or don't I fit in anywhere now?' My arms tightened about him. I'd never stopped loving him, even when Julian was my husband. It seemed there wasn't any one man who could give me everything— I want to make love with you, Catherine, before Carrie comes back. Quickly we shed our clothes. Our passion for each other had not lessened in all the years since we'd first met in this most intimate way. It didn't seem wrong. Not when he could murmur, Oh, Catherine, if there is one thing I wish for, it is to have you as mine all my life through, and when I die, let it be after such as this, with you in my arms, your arms about me, and you will be looking at me as you are now. How beautiful and poetic, I said. But you won't be fifty-two until September. I know you'll live to be eighty or ninety. And when you are, I pray passion will still rule both of us as it does now. He shook his head. I don't want to live to eighty unless you're with me and still love me. 
When you don't love me, let my time on earth be over. I didn't know what to say, but my arms spoke for me, drawing him closer so I could kiss him again and again. Then the phone was ringing. Lazily, I reached for it, then bolted straight up in the bed. Hello, my lady Catherine. It was Chris. Henny had a friend over when I called Paul, and her friend gave me your phone number. Kathy, what the hell are you doing in Virginia? I know Paul is with you, and I hope to God he can persuade you not to do whatever it is you've got on your mind. Paul is much more understanding than you are, and you are the one who should know best why I'm here. He made some noise of disgust. I do understand that's the worst of it, but you'll be hurt, I know that. And there's Mama. I don't want you to hurt her more than she already hurts, and you know she does. But more than anything, I don't want you to be hurt again, and you will be. You're always running from me, Kathy, and you can't ever run far enough or fast enough, because I'll be right at your heels, loving you. Whenever anything good happens to me, I sense you by my side, clinging to my hand, loving me as I love you, but refusing to recognize it because you think it's sin. If it is a sin, then hell would be heaven with you. I felt a terrible sense of panic as I hastily said goodbye and hung up, then turned to cuddle close to Paul, hoping he wouldn't know why I trembled. In the dead of night, with Paul deeply asleep in the tiny third bedroom, I woke suddenly. I thought I heard the mountains calling out, Devil's spawn! The wind through the hills whistled and shrieked, and added its voice to call me unholy, wicked, evil, and everything else the grandmother had named us. I got up and padded over to the windows to stare at the shadowy dark peaks in the distance, the same mountain peaks I'd gazed on so often from the attic windows. And yes, just like Corey, I could hear the wind blowing and howling like a wolf searching for me, wanting to blow me away too, just as it had blown Corey and made him into only dry dust. Quickly I ran to Carrie's room and crouched by her bed, wanting to protect her. For it seemed to me, in my nightmarish state, it was more likely the wind would take her before it got me. Chapter 28 Carrie's Bittersweet Romance Carrie was twenty now, I was twenty-seven, and this November Chris would be thirty. That seemed an impossible age for him to be. But when I looked at my jewellery, it hit me hard how quickly time moves as you get older. Time that had once moved so slowly speeded up, for our Carrie was in love with Alex. It sparkled from her blue eyes and danced her tiny feet around the room as she dusted, ran the vacuum, washed the dishes or planned menus for the next day. "'Isn't he handsome, Kathy? she asked. And I agreed, though honestly he was just an average, nice-looking boy of five, eight, or nine, with light brown hair that ruffled up easily and gave him a shaggy dog appearance that was somehow appealing, for he was so neat in other ways. His eyes were turquoise, and his expression that of someone who had never once had an ugly, unkind thought. Carrie thrilled to hear the phone ring. She bubbled with excitement, for so often the call was for her. She wrote Alex long, passionate love poems, then gave them to me to read, and stored them away without mailing them off to the one who should read them. I was happy for her, and for myself, too, for my ballet school was progressing nicely, and any day Chris would be coming home. Carrie, can you believe it? Chris's extended course is almost up. She laughed and came running to me, as she had when she was a little girl, and in my outstretched arms she flung herself "'I know,' she cried. "'Soon we will be a whole family again, like we used to be. "'Kathy, if I have a little boy with blonde hair and blue eyes, "'guess who I'll name him after.' "'I didn't have to guess. I knew. "'Her first-born, blonde, blue-eyed son would be called Cory. "'Carrie in love was pure enchantment to watch. "'She stopped talking of her small size "'and even began to feel she wasn't inadequate.' For the first time in her young life, she began to use makeup. Her hair was naturally wavy, like mine, but she had it cut shoulder length, 
and there it curled upward in a wild tumble. Look, Kathy, she cried when she came home from the beauty parlour with her new smarter hairstyle. Now my head doesn't look so big, does it? And have you noticed how much taller I've grown? I laughed. She was wearing shoes with three-inch heels and two inches of platform. But she was right. The shorter hair did make her head look smaller. Her youth, her loveliness, her joy, all touched me so much my heart ached in the awful apprehension that something might happen to spoil it for her. Oh, Kathy, said Carrie, I would want to die if Alex didn't love me. I want to make him the best possible wife. I'll keep his house so clean dust motes won't dance in the sunlight. Every night he'll eat the gourmet meals I prepare, never frozen TV junk. I'll make my own clothes, and his and our children's. I'll save him loads of money in lots of ways. He doesn't say much. He just sits and looks at me in that special soft way. So I take what I can from that, and not what words he says, for he hardly says any. I laughed and hugged her close. Oh, I did so long for her to be happy. Men don't talk as freely about love as women do, Carrie. Some like to tease you, and that's a pretty good indication you've got their interest and it can grow into something larger. And the way you find out how much they care is by looking into the eyes. Eyes never learn how to lie. It was easy to see that Alex was enchanted with Carrie. He was still working part-time as an electrician for a local appliance store while he took summer courses at the university, but he spent every spare minute with Carrie. I suspected he either had asked or was about to ask her to marry him. I woke suddenly a week later to see Carrie sitting before the bedroom windows and staring off toward the shadowy mountains. Carrie, who never had insomnia, as I often did. Carrie, who could sleep through thunderstorms, a tornado, telephone shrills a foot from her ears and a fire across the street. So naturally I was alarmed to see her there. I got up and went to her. Darling, are you all right? Why aren't you asleep? I wanted to be with you, near," she whispered, her eyes still riveted on the distant mountains, dark and mysterious in the night. They were all around us, boxing us in like they used to do. Alex asked me to marry him tonight. She told me this in a flat, dull tone, and I cried out, How wonderful! I'm so happy for you, Carrie, and for him. He told me something, Kathy. He's decided he wants to be a minister. Pain and sorrow were in her voice, and I didn't understand at all. Don't you want to be a minister's wife, I asked, while I was so frightened underneath. She seemed so remote. Ministers expect people to be perfect, she said in that deadly, scary tone, especially their wives. I remember all the things the grandmother used to say about us, about us being devil's issue and evil and sinful. I didn't used to understand what she meant, but I remember the words, and she was always saying we were wicked, unholy children who should never have been born. Should we have been born, Kathy? I choked, overwhelmingly frightened, and swallowed over the lump that rose in my throat. Carrie, if God hadn't wanted us to be born, he wouldn't have given us life in the first place. But, Kathy, Alex wants a perfect woman and I'm not perfect. Nobody is, Carrie. Absolutely nobody. Only the dead are perfect. Alex is perfect. He has never done even one bad thing. How would you know? Would he tell you if he had? Her lovely young face was darkly shadowed. Falteringly, she explained, It seems Alex and I have known each other for a long, long time, and until recently he didn't tell me much about himself. I've talked my head off to him, but I've never told him about our past, except how we became wards of Dr. Paul's after our parents died in an auto accident. And that's a lie, Kathy. We aren't orphans. We still have a mother who is alive. Lies are not deadly sins, Carrie. Everyone tells little lies now and then. Alex doesn't. Alex has always felt drawn toward God and religion. When he was younger, he wanted to become a Catholic so he could be a priest. He grew older and learned priests have to live lives of celibacy, 
so he decided against being a priest. He wants a wife and children. He told me he's never had sex with anyone because he's been looking all his adult life for just the right girl to marry. Somebody perfect, like me. Somebody godly, like him. And Kathy, she wailed pitifully. I'm not perfect. I'm bad. Like the grandmother was always telling us, I'm evil and unholy too. I have ugly thoughts. I hated those mean little girls who put me on the roof and said I was like an owl. I wished them all to die. And Sissy Towers, I hated her more than any other. And Kathy, did you know Sissy Towers drowned when she was twelve? I never wrote and told you, but I felt it was my fault for hating her so much. I hated Julian, too, for taking you away from Paul, and he died, too. You see how it is? How can I tell Alex all of that, and then tell him our mother married her half-uncle, too? He'd hate me, Kathy. He wouldn't want me then, I know he wouldn't. He'd think I would give birth to deformed children like me, and I love him so much. I knelt by the side of her chair and held her close as a mother would. I didn't know what to say and how to say it. I longed for Chris and his support, and for Paul, who always knew how to say everything just right. And remembering this, I took his words, said to me, and I repeated them to Carrie, even as I felt a terrible wrath against the grandmother who'd implanted all these crazy notions in the head of a five-year-old child. Darling, darling, I don't know how to say everything right, but I'm going to try. I want you to understand that what is black to one person is white to another. And nothing in this world is so perfect that it is pure white, or so bad it is pure black. Everything concerning human beings comes in shades of grey, Carrie. None of us is perfect, without flaws. I've had the same doubts about myself as you have. Her teary eyes widened to hear this, as if she considered me, of all people, perfect. It was our Dr. Paul who set me straight, Carrie. He told me long ago, if a sin was committed when our parents married and conceived children, it was their sin and not ours. He said God didn't intend to make us pay the price for what our parents did. And they weren't that closely related, Carrie. Do you know in ancient Egypt the Pharaoh would only allow his sons and daughters to marry a brother or sister? So you see, society makes the rules. And never forget, our parents had four children, and not one of us is a freak, so God didn't punish them or us. She glued her huge blue eyes to my face, desperately wanting to believe. And never, never should I have mentioned freak. Kathy, maybe God did punish me. I don't grow. That is punishment. I laughed shakily and drew her closer. Many other people are smaller than you. You aren't a midget or a dwarf, you know that. Even if you were, which you aren't, still you would have to accept it and make the best of it, just as many do, who consider themselves too tall or too fat or too thin or too something. You have a beautiful face, sensational hair, a lovely complexion, an adorable figure with everything where it should be. You have a beautiful singing voice, and you've got a brilliant mind. Look at how fast you can type and how well you take shorthand and keep Paul's books. And you can cook twice as well as I can. You are also a much better housekeeper than I am. And look at the dresses you sew. They look better than anything I see in a store. When you add all that up, Carrie, how can you think you aren't good enough for Alex or any other man? But Kathy, she wailed, stubbornly unappeased by what I'd said, you don't know him like I do. We went by an X-rated movie theater, and he said anybody who did any of those things was evil and perverted. And you and Dr. Paul told me sex and making babies was a natural, loving part of living. And I'm bad, Kathy. Once I did something very wicked. I stared at her, taken by surprise. With whom? It was as if she read my mind, for she shook her head while tears streamed down her cheeks. No, I've never had... had intercourse not with anybody but I did other things that were wicked Alex would think so and I should have known it was evil what did you do darling that was so terrible she gulped and bowed her head in shame it was Julian 
one day when I was visiting and you weren't home, he wanted to do... do something with me. He said it would be fun. It wasn't real sex, the kind that made babies. So I did what he wanted. And he kissed me and said, next to you, he loved me best. I didn't know it was wicked just to do what I did. I swallowed over the huge, aching lump in my throat, smoothing her silken hair from her fevered forehead and wiped away her tears. Don't cry and feel ashamed, darling. There are all kinds of love and ways to express love. You love Dr. Paul and Jory and Chris in three different ways and me in another. And if Julian convinced you to do something you feel was wicked, that was his sin, not yours. And mine, too, for I should have told you what he might want. He promised me never to touch you or do anything sexual with you, and I believed him. But if you did it, don't be ashamed any longer. And Alex doesn't have to know. Nobody will tell him. Very slowly, her head lifted, and the moon that suddenly came into view from behind dark clouds shone in her eyes full of self-torture. But I'll know. She began to sob, wild, hysterical sobs. That's not the worst thing, Kathy, she screamed. I liked doing what I did. I liked him wanting me to do it. I tried not to let my face show I was feeling any pleasure, for God might have been watching. So you see why Alex won't understand? He'd hate me, he would, I know he would. And even if he never knows, I'll still hate myself for doing it and liking it. Please stop crying. What you did isn't that bad, really. Forget our grandmother who kept talking about our evil blood. She's a bigoted, narrow-minded hypocrite who can't tell right from wrong. She did all kinds of horrible things in the name of righteousness and nothing at all in the name of love. You're not bad, Kathy. You wanted Julian to love you, and if what you did gave him pleasure and you pleasure, then that's normal too. People are made to feel sensual pleasure, made to enjoy sex. Julian was wrong, and he shouldn't have asked you, but that was his sin, not yours. I remember lots of things you don't think I do, she whispered. I remember the funny way Corey and I used to talk to each other, so you and Chris couldn't understand. We knew we were the devil's issue. We heard the grandmother. We talked about it. We knew we were locked up because we weren't good enough to be out in the world with people better than us. Stop, I cried. Don't remember. Forget. We did get out, didn't we? We were four children not responsible for the actions of our parents. That hateful old woman tried to steal our confidence and our pride in ourselves. Don't let her succeed. Look at Chris. Aren't you proud of him? Weren't you proud of me when I was on stage dancing? And one day, after you and Alex are married, he will change his mind about what is perverted and what isn't. For I did. Alex will grow up and stop being overly righteous. He doesn't know yet the pleasures love can give. Carrie pulled from my arms and went to stare out of the windows at the dark and distant mountains and at the quarter moon that sailed as an up-tilted Viking ship through the black seas of night. Alex won't change, she said dully. He's going to be a minister. Religious people think everything is bad, just like Grandmother. When he told me he was going to give up the idea of being an electrical engineer, I knew it was all over between us. Everybody changes. Look at the world about us, Carrie. Look at the magazines and the movies that decent people go to and enjoy, and the stage plays with everyone naked, and the kind of books being published. I don't know if it's for the better, but I do know people aren't static. We all change from day to day. Maybe twenty years from now our children will look back to our time and be shocked, and maybe they will look back and smile and call us innocents. Nobody knows how the world will change. So if the world can change, so can one man named Alex. Alex won't change. He hates today's lack of morals, hates the kinds of books being published, the movies that are dirty, and the magazines with couples doing wicked things. I don't think he even approves of the kind of dancing you used to do with Julian. I wanted to yell out, To hell with Alex and his prudery! Yet I couldn't slander the only man Carrie had found to love. Carrie, sweetheart, go to bed. Go to sleep and remember in the morning that the world is full of all sorts of men who would be delighted to love someone as pretty, sweet, and domestically oriented as you are. 
Think of what Chris tells us always. Things always happen for the best. And if it doesn't work out for you and Alex, then it will work out for you and someone else. She threw me a quick glance of deepest despair. How was it for the best when God made Corey die? Dear Lord, how to answer a question like that. Was it for the best when Daddy was killed on the highway? You don't remember that day. Yes, I do. I've got a good memory. Carrie, absolutely no one is perfect. Not me, not you, not Chris, not Alex. Not anybody. I know, she said, crawling into her bed like a good little girl obeying her mother. People do bad things and God sees them and punishes them later on. Sometimes he uses a grandmother with a whip, like she beat you and Chris. I'm not dumb, Kathy. I know you and Chris look at each other in the way Alex and I look at each other. I think you and Dr. Paul were lovers, too. And maybe that's why Julian died, to punish you. But you're the kind of woman men like, and I'm not. I don't dance. I don't know how to make everybody love me. Only my family loves me, and Alex. And when I tell Alex, he won't love me or want me. You won't tell him, I ordered sternly. She lay with her eyes fixed on the ceiling until finally she drifted off to sleep. Then I was the one left to lie awake, hurting inside, still astonished by the effect one old woman had on the lives of so many. I hated Mama for taking us to Foxworth Hall. She'd known what her mother was like, and still she took us there. She'd known her mother and father better than anyone, and still she married a second time and left us alone, so she had the fun and we had the torture. And it was us who were still suffering while she had the fun. Fun that would soon be over. For I was here and Bart was here, and sooner or later we would meet. Though how he had managed to avoid me so far, I wasn't to learn until later. I comforted myself with the thoughts of how Mama would be suffering soon, too, like we had suffered. Pain for pain, she'd learn how we had felt when she was left alone and unloved. She wouldn't be able to cope, not again. One more blow would be her undoing. Somehow I knew that. Perhaps because I was so much like her. Are you sure you're all right? I asked Carrie a few days later. You haven't been eating well. Where has your appetite gone? She sat quietly, her face expressionless. I'm just fine. I just don't feel like eating much. Don't take Jory with you today to your dance studio. Let me keep him all day. I miss him when he goes away with you. I felt uneasy about leaving her all day with Jory, who could be a handful, and Carrie didn't look like she was feeling well. Carrie, be honest with me, please. If you feel unwell, let me take you to a doctor. It's my time of the month, she said, with her eyes downcast. I just feel crampy in my middle three or four days before it starts. Only the blues of the month. And when you were her age, you did feel more cramps than at mine. I kissed my small son goodbye while he set up a terrible wail, wanting to go with me and watch the dancers. Want to hear the music, Mummy? objected Jory, who knew very well what he wanted and what he didn't. Want to watch the dancers? We'll go for a walk in the park. I'll push you in the swing and we'll play in the sandbox, said Carrie hastily, picking up my son and holding him close. Stay with me, Jory. I love you so much and I never see enough of you. Don't you love your Aunt Carrie? He smiled and threw his arms about her neck, for, yes, Jory loved everyone. It was a terribly long day. Several times I called to check on Carrie to see if she was all right. I'm fine, Kathy. Jory and I had a wonderful time in the park. I'm going to lie down now and take a nap, so don't call and wake me up again. Four o'clock came, and my last class of the day when my six- and seven-year-olds moved on out into the centre of the studio. While the music played, I counted un de plié, un de plié, and now un de tendu, close up, un de tendu, close up, and on and on I instructed, when suddenly I felt that prickly rise of my neck hackles to inform me that someone was staring at me intently. 
I whirled about to see a man standing far to the rear of the studio, Bart Winslow, my mother's husband. The minute he saw I recognized him, he came striding toward me. You do look sensational in purple tights, Miss Dial. May I have a moment of your time? I'm busy, I snapped, annoyed that he could ask when I had twelve little dancers I couldn't take my eyes off. My day will be over at five. If you care to, you can sit over there and wait. Miss Dahl, I've had one devil of a time finding you, and you've been right here under my nose all the time. Mr. Winslow, I said coolly, if I didn't mail you an adequate fee, you could have written a letter and it would have been forwarded to me. He knitted his dark, thick brows together. I'm not here about the fee, though you didn't pay me the price I had in mind. Smiling and assured, he slipped a hand inside his jacket and pulled from the breast pocket a letter. I gasped to see my own handwriting and all the postmarks and cancellation marks on that letter that had followed my mother all about Europe. I see you recognize this letter, he said, with his keen brown eyes watching my every flicker of expression. Look, Mr. Winslow, I said, very much in a state of flurry. My sister isn't feeling well today, and she's taking care of my son, who is hardly more than a baby. And you can see I've got my hands full here. Can we talk about this some other time? At your convenience, Miss Dahl, any time. He bowed and then handed me a small business card. Make it as soon as possible. I've many questions to ask you, and don't try skipping out. This time I'm keeping close tabs on you. You don't think one dinner date was enough, do you? It upset me so much to see him with that letter that the moment he was gone I dismissed my glass and went into my office. There I sat down to pore over my green ledger, totaling the figures and seeing I was still in the red. Forty students, I'd been assured when I bought out this school, but I hadn't been told most of them went away during the summers and didn't return until fall. All the spoiled little rich kids in the winter and the middle-class children in the summer who could only come once or twice a week. No matter how I stretched the money I earned, it didn't cover all my costs of redecorating and installing new mirrors behind the long bar. I glanced then at my watch, saw it was almost six o'clock, then changed into my street clothes and ran the two blocks to my small house. Carrie should have been in the kitchen preparing dinner while Jory played in the fenced-in yard, but I didn't see Jory, nor was Carrie in the kitchen. Carrie, I called. I'm home. Where are you and Jory hiding? In here, she responded in a thin whisper. All the way I ran to find her still in bed. Weakly, she explained Jory was staying with the next-door neighbor. Kathy, I don't really feel very good. I've thrown up four or five times. I can't remember how many, and I'm so crampy. I feel funny, real funny. I put my hand to her head and found it strangely cold, though the day was very warm. I'm going to call a doctor. No sooner were the words out of my mouth than I had to laugh bitterly at myself. There wasn't a doctor in this town who made house calls. I ran back to Carrie and stuck a thermometer in her mouth, then gasped to read the figures. Carrie, I'm going to get Jory, and then I'm driving you to the nearest hospital. You have a temperature of 103.6. Listlessly she nodded, then drifted off to sleep. I rushed next door to check on my son, who was happily playing with a little girl a month older than he was. Look, Mrs. Marquette, said Mrs. Townsend, a sweet motherly woman in her early forties who was taking care of her granddaughter. If Carrie is sick, let me keep Jory until you come home. I do hope Carrie isn't seriously ill. She's such a dear little thing. But I've noticed she's been looking pale and miserable for a day or so. I'd noticed the same thing and had tied it all to her romance with Alex that was going awry. How wrong I was. The very next day I called Paul. Catherine, what's wrong? he said when he heard the panic in my voice. I spilled it all out, how Carrie was sick and in the hospital, where they had already made several tests and still they didn't know what was wrong with her. Paul, she looks dreadful and she's losing weight fast, unbelievably fast. She's vomiting, can't keep any food down, and has diarrhea, too. She keeps calling for you and Chris, too. I'll have another doctor fill in for me here and fly right up there, he said without hesitation. 
But wait before you try and get in touch with Chris. The symptoms you name are so common to a number of minor ailments. I took him at his word and didn't try and contact Chris, who was enjoying a two-week tour of the West Coast before he came home and continued his residency. In three hours, Paul was with me in the hospital room, staring down at Carrie. She smiled weakly to see him there and held out her thin arms. Hello, she whispered thinly. I'll bet you didn't think you'd see me in an old hospital bed, did you? Immediately, he took her in his arms and began to ask questions. What were her first signs that something was wrong? About a week ago, I started feeling very tired. I didn't tell Kathy because she worries so much about me anyway. Then I had headaches and I felt sleepy all the time. And I got big bruises and didn't know how I got them. Then I combed my hair and lots and lots of it came out. And then I just started throwing up. And other things that other doctors have already asked me and I told them. Her thin, whispering voice drifted off. I wish I could see Chris, she mumbled, before her eyes closed and she was asleep. Paul had already seen Carrie's chart and talked to her doctors. Now he turned to me with that blank expression that put dread in my heart. It was so fraught with meaning. Maybe you ought to send for Chris. Paul, do you mean... No, I don't mean that. But if she wants him, he should be here with her. I was in the hall waiting for the doctors to do certain tests on Carrie. They had chased me from the room. As I paced back and forth before the closed door to her room, I sensed him before I saw him. I whirled about, catching my breath, to see Chris striding down the long corridor, bypassing nurses carrying bedpans and trays of medicines, who gaped to see him in all his splendid glory. Time rolled backward and I saw Daddy, Daddy as I best remembered him, dressed in white tennis clothes. I couldn't speak when Chris took me in his arms and bowed his tanned face down into my hair. I heard the thud of his heart beating strong and regular. I sobbed so near a deluge of tears. It didn't take you long to get here. His face was in my hair and his voice was husky. Kathy, he asked raising his head and looking me directly in the eyes. What is wrong with Carrie? His question stunned me, for he should know. Can't you guess? It's that damned arsenic. I know it is. What else could it be? She was fine until a week ago, then all of a sudden she's sick. I broke then and sobbed. She wants to see you. But before I led him to Carrie's small room, I put in his hand a note I'd found in the diary she'd started the day she met Alex. Chris, Carrie knew for a long time something was going wrong, but she kept it to herself. Read this and tell me what you think. While he read, my eyes stayed glued to his face. Dear Kathy and Chris, Sometimes I think you two are my real parents, but then I remember my real mama and daddy, and she seems like a dream that never was, and I can't picture daddy unless I have his photograph in my hand. "'though I can picture Corey just like he was. "'I've been hiding something, "'so if I don't write this, you are going to blame yourselves. "'For a long time I felt I was going to die soon, "'and I don't care any more like I used to. "'I can't be a minister's wife. "'I wouldn't have lived this long if you two and Jory "'and Dr. Paul and Henny hadn't loved me so much. "'Without all of you to hold me here, "'I would have gone on to Corey a long time ago.' Everybody has somebody special to love except me. Everybody has something special to do except me. I've always known I'd never get married. I knew I was fooling myself about having children, for my hips are too narrow, and I think, too, I'm too small to make a good wife. I'd never be anybody special like you, Kathy, who can dance and have babies and everything else. I can't be a doctor like Chris, so I'd just be nothing much. Just somebody to get in the way and worry everybody because I'm unhappy. So right now, before you read on further, promise in your heart you won't let the doctors do anything to make me live on. Just let me die and don't cry. Don't feel sad and miss me after I'm buried. Nothing has been right or felt right since Corey went away and left me. What I regret most is I won't be around to watch Jory dance on stage like Julian used to. Now I have to confess the truth. 
I loved Julian the same as I love Alex. Julian never thought I was too little, and he was the only one who made me feel a normal woman for a short time. Though it was sinful, even when you say it was not, I know it was, Kathy. Last week I started thinking about the grandmother and what she used to say to us all the time about being the devil's spawn. The more I thought about it, the more I knew she was right. I shouldn't have been born. I am evil. When Corey died because of the arsenic on the sugared doughnuts the grandmother gave us, I should have died too. You didn't think I knew, did you? You thought all the time I was sitting on the floor in the corner I couldn't hear and didn't take notice. But I was seeing and hearing. But I didn't believe back then. Now I believe. Thank you, Kathy, for being like my mother and the best sister alive. And thank you, Chris, for being my substitute father and my second best brother. And thank you, Dr. Paul, for loving me even though I didn't grow. Thank all of you for never being ashamed to be seen with me. And tell Henny I love her. I think maybe God won't want me either until I grow taller. And then I think about Alex, who thinks God loves everybody, even when they aren't so tall. She'd signed that letter in a huge scrawl to make up for her small size. Oh, dear God, cried Chris. Kathy, what does this mean? Only then could I open my purse and take from it something I'd found hidden away in the dark, far end of the closet in Carrie's room. His blue eyes grew wide, and the colour seemed to fade as he read the name of the rat poison bottle, then saw the package of sugared doughnuts with only one left. One left. It had been bitten into just once. Tears began to course down his cheeks. Then he was really sobbing on my shoulder. Oh, God! She put that arsenic on the doughnuts, didn't she? So she could die in the same way Corey did. I broke free from his clutching arms and backed a few feet away, feeling I was drained of all blood. Chris, read that letter over again. Didn't you notice what she wrote? How she didn't believe and now I believe? Why wouldn't she believe back then and believe now? Something happened. Something happened to make her believe that our mother could poison us. He shook his head in a bewildered fashion, the tears still eking from his eyes. But if she knew all along, how could anything more happen to convince her when overhearing us talking and seeing Mickey die didn't? How can I tell you, I cried out desperately. But the doughnuts have been liberally coated with arsenic. Paul had them tested. Carrie ate those knowing they would kill her. Can't you see this is another murder our mother committed? She isn't dead yet, Chris cried. We'll save her. We won't let her die. We'll talk to her, tell her she has to hold on. I ran to hold him, fearing it was too late and desperately hoping it wasn't. Even as we clung together, made parents again by our common suffering, Paul came from Carrie's room. The solemn expression on his drawn face told me everything. Chris, said Paul calmly, how wonderful to see you again. I'm sorry the circumstances are so sad. There's hope, isn't there? cried Chris. There's always hope. We are doing what we can. You look so tan and vibrant. Hurry in to see your sister and pass along some of that vitality to her. Catherine and I have said all we can think of to try to make her fight back and gain her will to live, but she has given up. Alex is in there on his knees by her bed praying for her to live, but Carrie has her head turned toward the windows. I don't think she realizes what is said or what is done. She's gone off somewhere out of our reach. Paul and I trailed along behind Chris, who ran to Carrie. She lay thin as a rail beneath a pile of heavy covers when it was still summer. It just didn't seem possible she could age so quickly. All the firm, ripe, rosy roundness of youth had fled, leaving her small face gaunt and hollow. Her eyes were deep pits to make her cheekbones very prominent. She even seemed to have lost some of her height. Chris cried out to see her so. He leaned to gather her in his arms, called her name repeatedly, stroked her long hair. To his horror, hundreds of the golden strands clung to his fingers when he drew them away. Good 
God in heaven, what's being done for her? When he brushed the hair from his fingers, I hurried forward to pluck them from his hands, and in a plastic box I carefully laid them out. The electric static of the box kept them in place. An idiot notion, but I couldn't bear to see her beautiful hair swept up and thrown away. Her hair glinted on the pillows, on the bedspread, on the white lace of her bed jacket. As in a trance of nightmares unending, I gathered up the long hairs and arranged them neatly, while Alex prayed on and on. Even as he was introduced to Chris, he paused only long enough to nod. Paul, answer me. What is being done to help Carrie? Everything we know how to do, answered Paul, his voice low and soft the way people speak when death is near. A team of good doctors are working around the clock to save her, but her red blood cells are being destroyed faster than we can replace them with transfusions. Three days and nights, all of us lingered beside Carrie's bedside while my neighbor took care of Jory. Each of us who loved her prayed that she'd live. I called Henny and told her to go to church and have all her family and church members pray for Carrie, too. She tapped over the line her signal for yes, yes. Flowers arrived daily to fill her room. I didn't look to see who sent them. I sat beside Chris or Paul or between both and held to their hands and silently prayed. I looked with distaste upon Alex, whom I believed responsible for much of what was wrong with Carrie. Finally, I could keep my question to myself no longer. I got up and stalked Alex and backed him into a corner. Alex, why would Carrie want to die during the happiest days of her life? What did she tell you and what did you say? He turned his bewildered, unshaven, grief-stricken face to mine. What did I say? he asked, his eyes red-rimmed from lack of sleep. I repeated my question with an even harder edge to my voice. He shook his head as if to clear it, looking hurt and sleepy, as he ran long fingers through the tumble of his uncombed brown curls. Kathy, God knows I've done everything I can to convince her I love her, but she won't listen to me. She turns her face aside and says nothing. I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. She threw her arms about my neck and said yes over and over again. Then she said, Oh, Alex, I'm not nearly good enough for you. And I laughed and said she was perfect, just exactly what I wanted. Where did I go wrong, Kathy? What did I do to make her turn against me so now she won't even look my way? Alex had the kind of sweet pious face you expect to see carved only on marble saints. Yet as he stood there, so humbled, so racked by grief and torn by love turned against him, I reached out and soothed him as best I could, for he did love Carrie. In his own way, he loved her. Alex, I'm sorry if I sounded harsh. Forgive me for that. But did Carrie confess anything to you? Again his eyes clouded. I called and asked to see her a week ago, and her voice sounded strange, as if something terrible had happened, and she couldn't speak about it. I drove as fast as I could to be with her, but she wouldn't let me in. Kathy, I love her. She's told me she's too small and her head is too large, but in my eyes her proportions are just right. To me she was a dainty doll who didn't know she was beautiful, and if God lets her die, I will never in this life find my credence again. That's when he buried his face in his hands and began to cry. It was the fourth night after Chris arrived. I dozed beside Carrie. The others were trying to catch a catnap before they too were ill, and Alex was napping in the hall on a cot when I heard Carrie call my name. I ran to her bed and knelt beside it, then reached for her small hand under the covers. It was only a bony hand now, with skin so translucent her veins and arteries could be seen. Darling, I've been waiting for you to wake up, I whispered in a hoarse voice. Alex is in the hall, and Chris and Paul are napping in the doctor's quarters. Shall I call them in? No, she whispered. I want to talk only to you. I'm going to die, Kathy. She said it so calmly as if it didn't matter, as if she accepted it and was glad. No, I objected strongly. You are not going to die. I'm not going to let you die. 
I love you as my own child. Many people love and need you, Carrie. Alex loves you so much, and he wants to marry you. And he won't be a minister now, Carrie. I've told him it makes you uncomfortable. He doesn't really care what his career is as long as you stay alive and love him. He doesn't care if you are small or if you have children. Let me call him in so he can tell you all. No, she whispered thinly. I've got something secret to tell you. Her voice was so faint it seemed to come from over hundreds of soft, rounded little hills far, far away. I saw a lady on the street. Her voice was so low I had to lean to hear. She looked so much like Mama, I had to run up. I caught hold of her hand. She snatched hers away and turned cold, hard eyes on me. I don't know you, she said. Kathy, that was our mother. She looks like she used to, almost, only a little older. She even had on the pearl necklace with the diamond butterfly clasp that I remember. And Kathy, when your own mother doesn't want you, don't that mean nobody can want you? She looked at me and she knew who I was. I saw it in her eyes. And still she didn't want me because she knows I'm bad. That's why she said what she did, that she didn't have any children. She doesn't want you or Chris either, Kathy, and all mothers love and want their children unless they're evil, unholy children like us. Oh, Carrie, don't let her do this to you. It's the love of money that made her deny you, not that you were bad or wicked or unholy. You haven't done anything evil. It's money that matters to her, Carrie, not us. But we don't need her. Not when you have Alex and Chris, Paul and me, and Jory too, and Henny. Don't break our hearts, Carrie. Hang on long enough to let the doctors help you. Don't give up. Jory wants his aunt back. Every day he asks where you are. What am I going to tell him, that you didn't care enough to live? Jory don't need me, she said in the manner she'd spoken when she was a child. Jory's got lots of people besides me to love and care for him. But Corey, he's waiting for me, Kathy. I can see him right now. Look over there behind your shoulder. He's standing next to Daddy, and they want me more than anyone here. Carrie, don't. It's nice where I'm going, Kathy. Flowers everywhere, and beautiful birds, and I can feel myself growing taller. Look, I'm almost as tall as Mama, like I always wanted to be. And when I get there, nobody's ever going to say again I got eyes big and scary as an owl's. Nobody will ever call me dwarf again and tell me to use a stretching machine. Because I'm just as tall as I want to be. Her weak and trembling voice faded away. Her eyes rolled heavenward and stayed open without blinking. Her lips stayed parted as if she had something else to tell me. Dear God. She was dead. Mama had started all of this. Mama got out of everything scot-free, scar-free, and rich, rich, rich. All she had to do was shed a few tears of self-pity after she went home. That's when I screamed. I know I screamed. I wailed and wanted to rip the hair from my head and tear the skin from my face, for I looked too much like that woman who had to pay, 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 and then pay some more. On a hot August day, we buried Carrie in the Sheffield family plot, a few miles outside the city limits of Claremont. No rain this time, no snow on the ground. Now death had claimed every season but winter, and left only that cold, blustery weather for me to rejoice in. We covered Carrie over with the crimson flowers she so loved, and purple ones, too. The sun above was a rich saffron color, almost orange, before it turned to vermilion as it sank to the horizon and turned the heavens rosy red. My thoughts were like the dry leaves blowing in the strong wind of hate as I sat on and on and on, though the marble bench beneath me was hard and uncomfortable. I made those dry leaves, after I gathered them together and twisted them, into a cruel witch's stick, 
a thing to stir up a neglected brew of revenge. Out of the four Dresden dolls, only two were left, and one would do nothing. He had taken an oath to do what he could to preserve life and keep alive even those who didn't deserve to live. I was loath to leave Carrie alone in the night, the first one she'd spend in the ground. I had to spend this one night with her and comfort her in some unknown way. I threw a glance at where Julia and Scotty lay asleep too near Paul's parents and an older brother who had died even before Amanda was born. I wondered what we, the Foxworths, were doing in the Sheffield family plot. What meaning was there to any of this? If Alex hadn't come into Carrie's life when he did and given her love, would she have been better off? If Carrie hadn't spied Mama on the street and raced to catch up with her, happy enough to take hold of her hand and call her Mama, would that have made a difference? It must have made all the difference. It must have. Straight from her mother's denial, she had gone to purchase rat poison because she didn't feel fit to live, not when even her mother could deny her. And the poison on the doughnuts hadn't been just a trace, but heavily laced, pure arsenic. Someone spoke my name softly. Someone reached with tenderness to lift me up by my elbows. With his arm about my waist, supporting me, he led me from the cemetery, where I would have stayed until dawn to see the sun come up. No, darling, said Chris. Carrie doesn't need you now, but others do. Kathy, you must forget the past and your plans for revenge. I see the look on your face and read your mind. I'll share with you my secret for finding peace. I've tried to give it to you before, but you refused to listen. Now this time, listen and believe. Do as I do and force yourself to forget everything that gives you pain and remember only what gives you joy. It is the whole secret to happy living, Kathy. Forgetting and forgiving bitter, bleak eyes I turned upon him, and scornfully I said, You are indeed very good at forgiving, Christopher, but at forgetting, now that is another matter. He flushed as red as the dying sun. Kathy, please, isn't forgiving the better half? I only remember the sweeter part. No, no. But I clung to him as one who approaches hell holds tight to salvation. Though I'm not sure, I thought I saw a woman dressed in black, with her head and face covered by a black veil, duck behind a tree as we approached the road in the parked car, hiding so we wouldn't see her. But I caught a glimpse, enough to reveal the rope of lustrous pearls she wore, pearls that were there for a thin white hand to lift and nervously out of long habit twist and untwist into a knot. Only one woman I knew did that, and she was the perfect one to wear black and should run to hide, forever hide, color all her days black, every last one. I'd see to it that all her remaining days on earth were black, blacker than the tar put on my hair, blacker than anything in that locked room and in the darkest shadows in the attic that had been given to us when we were fearful and young and needing so much to be loved enough, blacker than the deepest pit in hell. I'd waited long enough to deliver what I must long enough, and even with Chris here to try and stop me, even he wouldn't be enough to prevent what I had to do.'